Um, we're going to call the meeting to order of the uh, Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation Motorcycle Safety Advisory Board. It's 10 a.m. on Thursday, April 29th, 2021. Uh, everybody, please remember, mute your microphones, only turn them on when you speak. Uh, and please remember to announce your name when speaking. We'll begin with the roll call and the certification of quorum. And Delia, can you do the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Yes. Keith Ravel, presiding officer. Here. Roger Bowles. Here. Chris Litvin. And we do have a call in for Mr. Litvin, and he has not responded, so not here yet. Ricky Wyatt. Out. Commander Robert Ritzman. I'm here. Michael Manster. Present. Kyle McNew. Present. Thank you. Jude Chex Snyder is out today. Jeffrey Alpert. Present. And we have a quorum. Thank you, Delia. Okay, we're at item C on the agenda now, the approval of the minutes from our meeting on January 7th of this year. Um, board members, uh, would somebody please make a motion and a second to approve the minutes of January 7th, 2021? Kyle McNew, motion to approve minutes. Thank you. Is there any discussion of the minutes? Okay, Delia, would you tally the vote? Yes, sir. Keith Ravel, presiding officer. Aye. Roger Bowles. Aye. Robert Richman. Aye. Michael Manser. Aye. Kyle McNew. Aye. And Jeffrey Alpert. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, on to item D on the agenda, public comment. A reminder that if you wish to address the board, you must submit an email by following the public comments instructions found in the last page of the agenda that was provided for the meeting today, or you can go to the tdlr.texas.gov website. If you're sending an email, please remember uh, they must be submitted to the board by noon the prior day before a meeting. Okay, and as of right now, TDLR offices are not open for public comment. Uh, the Safety Advisory Board did receive one public comment. It was sent to the board members beforehand. We will not read that publicly. And at this time, we do not have anybody who wishes to speak under public comments. So we're gonna go ahead and move to item E on the staff reports. And we'll begin with uh, the licensing division, and we have Jacqueline Rollins, program specialist, with that update. Good morning, presiding officer, Ravel, and board members. I am Jacqueline Rollins on behalf of the licensing department, and my report is for the active motorcycle instructor. Um, as of today, we do not have any new licensing issued. Um, for renewals, we have issued 104 total 276 and for active ATV instructors, uh, no new licenses issued, no renewals, renewals issued, I'm sorry, and total population is 48. And as far as the S MSB eight certificate orders, they have issued 12,674. That concludes my report. Do you have any questions? Yes, I have one question. Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, Jeff Alford, yes, uh, the MSBA R's, is there any movement on getting those printed for the replacement certificates? Yes, the sir, that is number? in the works. We are uh, getting the forms updated, and as soon as we receive those, uh, we will get the orders uh, processed and issued at once we receive the, the new forms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And Ms. Rollins, uh, Keith Rovell, I have a uh, question also. Do we have an average time as far as what it is taking to get the uh, certificates to the providers once ordered? Once they're ordered, uh, they're processed the same day. Um, 
and then they're picked up the next morning from FedEx. And then once FedEx picks them up, usually two to three days. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions for Ms. Rollins? Very good. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's go now to the uh, customer service division and another Jacqueline, Jacqueline Rush, the manager of that uh, division with her update. Hi, good morning, board members. It's good to see you today. I'm going to start out with our staff report. And uh, there's quite a few items here. I'll read them quickly. Um, so uh, save a little bit of time, but just wanted to let you know that the four CSRs that we hired in December have concluded their training and have joined the rest of our staff. We have about 51 CSRs, one that works part-time, and uh, they were trained to adhere to a preset call workflow. They were trained to use the NICE and contact phone system. They update a customer relationship management system that we um, use. It's a Microsoft product that we use to update call notes so that we can uh, reduce customer effort so they don't have to re-explain every time they call what's going on, and we can kind of keep track of issues if they arise. Um, they uh, just position and tag each call at the end of their call. Um, what that means is it lets us know uh, what the call was about so that we can report it to you and to our public. Um, they are also uh, trained to send email templates from our CRM um, to make sure that consistent, accurate information is going out um, to the public. And, you know, a lot of people call us from their cars, so we want to make sure people are getting, um, you know, the information um, without needing to call back later, um, and they can just have it handy. They are uh, taught to communicate more complicated issues to their team leads. Um, and so if we have a resource to our friends in uh, licensing or education, for example, or RPM, uh, that uh, communication is managed through our five team leads. Um, they're taught to navigate several licensing databases that we inherited when we received various programs. Um, and those are listed here, uh, not limited to those, but those are some examples. And uh, they're taught to research and answer questions for uh, 40 programs and hundreds of license types. Um, since March of 2020, we, we do continue to work remotely. Um, if you have any questions on that, please let me know. The uh, statistics in front of you um, for uh, fiscal year 2021 um, from the time that that we uh, started with the motor cycle and ATV safety uh, program. Um, it, you can see the numbers are kind of interesting. There's, there was a decline steadily through February. Um, I did check on the numbers last week at the time that uh, these statistics were due. We hadn't published March yet. Um, so I can tell you that uh, the next time you, we meet, you'll see a, a surge again in, in numbers um, going in the opposite direction. Um, and we'll keep an eye since the uh, instructor courses have become available to see how that also impacts the kind of calls that we're getting and the number of calls that we're getting. Um, and uh, the calls continue to be about, you know, getting help navigating the website, um, information about uh, starting school, uh, renewing licenses, uh, checking on statuses, and that kind of a thing. So um, it's been it's been really great to listen to the calls um, to see how our staff is getting to learn more about the program, and uh, the conversations are, are, are you know are getting to be a lot smoother. It's been really great uh, getting to know your community. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Miss Rush, Jeff Alford. Um... Board member, question for you. What is the tools team? That is a team that, uh, so the various licensing programs are broken up to different teams. That particular team um, handles uh, towing. They uh, handle the new motor fuels program and a few other programs. Um, this particular program, uh, of, of yours, motorcycle safety is handled by a team called safety regulators. That's internal jargon that um, actually is on my agenda uh, today for our division meeting uh, to discuss because usually it, it doesn't make much sense to the public, right? So hopefully um, what we hope we're doing is just referring to licensing in general, right? Um, because that's what it is and that's what makes more sense to the public. Um, does that answer your question? 
Yes. Uh, so the reason for my question is I had called in. Um, I have various uh, issues, mostly relating back to rims and not being able to enter something into the system. Um, I have yet to have any of my questions answered or be able to be resolved on the phone. And last I was told I was being referred to the tools team, uh, but I was not able to be told what the tools team was by the person on the phone for customer service. And that was a, a week ago. And I've still not heard back from the tools team, which now I understand why I'm not a part of their team or a part of their problem. Uh, but I have yet to receive uh, any. Uh, you haven't gotten a call back. Right. So, I've got nothing back to resolve the not, issue. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Believe it or not, I actually, that's one of the calls I just happened to quality monitor last week. Um, and so we are going over that um, today in terms of internal jargon. So that was a mistake. Um, the, the CSRs are um, taking calls for, you know, 40 different programs and uh, even if she misspoke, she would have sent that callback request to a team lead who would have gotten it to the correct place. So I'll be happy to check on that for you and just see what happened to uh, that callback request and see if we can get you some assistance. Um, and if that Thank ever you. happens, you know, feel free to call us beforehand. Um, and, you know, the advisory board staff can, can get with our team and we can help get you that answer. But um, I actually did listen to that call. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I appreciate the feedback and, and um, I'll, uh -huh. Mary Winston TDLR. I wanted to say to Mr. Alfred, it's so nice of you to only call the customer service folks because folks call our email um, advisory boards. Um, all the time <laughs> and and we'll refer it out so we don't want you to have to keep doing something that's not necessary and Jacqueline is definitely working with that team that team, that team. and I'm being hit up right now by uh, Shanna Steve Villanueva um, so if you contact any of us we'll get on it that was a mistake as she said and we do have folks that just contact I'm going to put it out there ladies advisory.boards at tdlr.texas.gov all the time and we kind of refer them where they need to go. So we didn't get all of your issue, but we'll get you a call back today if that's good with you. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, our, our team Shan's awesome. I get call I get emails and calls back directly from her. So everything I've done with education has been fantastic. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have um, access to runs, so we would do a callback request. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fairly confident that your uh, callback request went to the correct team because a team lead wouldn't have sent it to the incorrect team. Um, but I'll study the journey of um, where it went and 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 uh, see if we can't get your call back. Jacqueline, this is um, Michael Manser. Say, my question is: so, so Jeff had this issue, and there's some accommodation there for that. But how often or do is there any tracking of how long issues take when people call in? So like if Jeff were uh, a member of the motorcycle community just calling in as you know a, a non instructor or something, uh, is there tracking on how long it takes to resolve these issues and get back to people? Yes, yes, actually. Um, with you know questions that we can answer on the phone we'll you know <clears throat> obviously answer right on the phone um for questions that need research from other divisions um that does get tracked um those messages get forwarded um within the same day and sometimes within the hour um sometimes within, within a few minutes just depending on what the moment is um and then um so we'll have a record of when we send the request if it's if a callback is needed from another division for a question that we cannot answer. So if there's anything that you'd like us to research, definitely let us know. Okay, are there any other questions at this time? Thank you, Jacqueline. Hearing none, You're we'll move okay. on. And our next presenter is uh, Michael Strong, the manager of the Education and Examination Division. Good morning, Chairman, members. Uh, my name is Michael Strong. I'm the manager for Education and Examination. Uh, today, I'm going to start with our statistics. We have the last new school that we had was still back in November, which still leaves us for a total of new two new schools in our program since we brought this over from 
uh, DPS uh, with a total of 74 schools right now. Uh, moving down, as you see, all of our school renewals hit at the same time. So August of this year, uh, we will have all of our schools renewing during that period. Um, so you will not see anything at, uh, on that list until right now. I did want to bring attention to the motorcycle course riders and the course curriculum. You'll see that the numbers have dropped. Um, I wanted to kind of give some, some background on that. The numbers that from September through November were what we inherited from DPS. Um, as you know, many courses or curriculum such as uh, track only schools uh, chose not to be regulated anymore or not to maintain a license because we were not covering track only days. Um, so those curriculums have gone away, which is why you see the numbers where they are now. We did an audit of all of our available uh, and currently licensed courses, uh, and these are the, the correct numbers that you'll see now. Um, so the numbers before were correct. This is just what we've looked at to see what was truly active now that we have inherited the program. And then moving down onto our projects. Um, the biggest project, as you all know, and it's going to be talked about here later, is we have finally finished and finalized the TEKS contract uh, for instructor preparation courses. This has been something that we've been really working hard and diligently with TEKS, with our work groups, uh, with our general counsel on getting this set up and getting it uh, in place. Because as we've heard you all saying throughout many months now, the number one thing that we need to accomplish in Texas is to increase the number of available instructors to train motorcycle riders out there. So we're very excited that that is now in place and our first classes are coming up um, here very soon. Next, um, as you're kind of already touched on, uh, all motorcycle schools will expire on August 20, uh, 21 of this year. Um, we would like you all to be sure that you get those renewals into us as soon as possible. Um, you can send them in 90 days prior to that expiration date. Uh, the forms are on our website, and we would ask you to, of course, always get those in as soon as possible so there's not a delay in making sure that your uh, schools are renewed on time, you have your license and everything else during that time. Um, incident reports. This has been something that we've continued as we have taken over this, taken over this program and continue to learn. Um, everybody is very in this community is very much aware of the incident reports that they're doing for MSF, for total control. TDLR has our own incident reports, and we have since day one. Um, we are asking now, a lot of people have submitted the MSF ones to us whenever there is an MSF, there is a incident report. We're asking that moving forward, schools are required to submit it on our form. It is out there, it's on our website. Um, if anybody has questions on it, I will certainly help them find it. Uh, but we're going to, if you submit the an MSF or a total control incident report, uh, or any other curriculum incident report, we're going to kick it back to you and ask you to fill it out on the agency's incident report form. Um, we have made that form fillable. We're also doing some enhancements to it uh, where when you fill it out, you can just click a button and it will auto submit that for you as well. So we're trying to make that process as smooth and as easy as possible uh, for submitting your reports, especially when it's fillable uh, electronically so that you're not having to hand write it. Some of the pre done information that's already there can be pre-populated and left so that when you're kicking out multiple incident reports, um, it's gonna be much easier and faster for your school to do so. So we're excited about that. Um, we also wanted to, you know, Jeff brought up a, uh, an important point about RIMS. We continue to find different information out about RIMS and classes as they start bringing things to us. Um, as we do that, we're trying to release information out to you all and make people aware of the different things that we're finding, nuances with students that have the same names or preventing classes from being um, updated at the same time. Uh, we would also make sure that what we have found is expired instructor numbers. It will not allow a class to be uploaded. And this is probably one of the most frequent issues that we get emailed about on RIMS is having expired instructor certifications. Um, so. You know, much like we talked about with the school renewals, please make sure on your license renewals that you're doing that uh, well in advance as well, because if you're waiting to the last minute to renew your instructor license and it doesn't get to you or get processed in time, those classes are not going to be uh, able to be uploaded into RIMS. Um, additionally, when it comes to RIMS, 
uh, anytime that you have a uh, instructor that's met the requirements to move up from a six to one ratio to an eight to one student ratio in their courses, you are going to have to uh, email the education team, uh, education at tdlr.texas.gov. Uh, that is not something that happens automatically inside of rooms. Uh, we will have people that know they're there that will want to teach in an eight to one. You do need to contact us ahead of time. Let us know so we can get that corrected. Uh, Shanesty and her team uh, are great on making sure that that gets taken care of almost immediately. Um, but we do want to point that out just for you know how how make sure that your classes are going smooth, that you're not having any uh, hangups during your you know, class uploads. Next point is motorcycle school audits. We've talked about that for a while now. Um, you know, we're excited to announce that we've performed our, uh, an audit at this point, and we're scheduling audits here very soon to start doing multiple audits within a weekend um, as we go out. We've, pre we've prepared our SOP, we have our checklists, we have our processes in place, um, and we look forward to getting out there and actually um, making this a a scheduled deal. We're out there constantly within our community to make sure that schools and you know providers are doing exactly what they should be doing, um, that we're working with the community to continue to enhance safety, and that we're continuing to grow ourselves as well and learn while we're out there. Um, I would like to point out that our very first audit that was performed was done also during an investigation that was being performed. Um, February 20th of this year, we tragically lost the life of a 64-year-old woman uh, during a motorcycle training course. Uh, this was a three-wheel uh, three motorcycle course, and during the cone weave exercise, uh, she lost control of her motorcycle, struck a curb, and was thrown from that motorcycle uh, almost 30 feet. Uh, the instructor called emergency responders and uh, immediately ran to the individual's aid, um, and unfortunately, she, she passed from that. Um, TDLR, you know, upon hearing this, uh, immediately went out to perform an on-site investigation of the incident, um, looked at the police report, looked at all the photos, the videos, um, you know, we also were there conducted an audit, uh, as I said, of the classroom, the range, the motorcycle, uh, to look to see if there were any opportunities there for, uh, to, to make sure that there was, first of all, no contributing factors beyond human error. Um, or that there were no other issues with the, the classroom or the range of the motorcycle. Uh, we found that the classroom, and the range, and everything else met all of the course specifications and the motorcycle was in well maintained and proper working condition. Um, but this highlights a point that, that's important to all of us. You know, we, we talk about bringing forward issues to the Motorcycle Safety Advisory Board um, with our work groups to determine if there might be an opportunity for us uh, or if it's prudent to us to require additional safety measures within our training courses. Uh, if there's safety devices that need to be added to certain motorcycles. Um, I think this really highlights that importance and really brings back to the forefront of what we all look to gain from our cooperation with you all, our cooperation with the schools that are out there, uh, as we continue to look for those opportunities to enhance safety measures. And so moving forward, um, we take this loss of life from this individual and we are looking to making sure that that is not in vain, that we work with you all um, to continue to enhance our safety measures and our protocols within this. Um, you know, we hold motorcycling very dear in our hearts. You all certainly do, uh, we do as well. And uh, so we're looking forward to working with the work groups here moving forward to see if there's any opportunities here on how we can enhance safety within the community. And then finally, uh, apologize. Uh, and last, you know, again, none of these efforts and none of these uh, safety measures go anywhere unless we're doing proper outreach and that we're making ourselves available and that we're teaching others that are out there. So we're proud to announce that uh, this weekend, uh, Saturday, uh, we will be speaking at the Texas Motorcycle Safety Forum. Uh, there's a lot of different individuals. We're grateful that TTI has requested us to be a part of that, um, where we're going to look at driver education curriculum and uh, motorcycle curriculum, um, talk about that. We have experts coming from the driver education world, from the regulatory side, 
uh, and the motorcycling industry as well. And finally bringing all those together. And so we're, we're excited for that. We sent out a notification earlier this week uh, to hopefully get not only motorcyclists and individuals in the motorcycling community involved, but also to bring driver education instructors uh, and schools into the mix as well so that they can learn what, what we're talking about. Uh, with that, that is the conclusion of my report and I am open to any questions that you all may have. Jeff Alford, TDLR board. Ford, do you mind if I uh, hit you up with some rapid fire type questions to just kind of run through these suckers and get them answered? Uh, that's what I'm here for. Yes, sir. All right, brother. This is what I got for you. Uh, okay. Do we have to keep track of issued e-course codes on a separate spreadsheet as we did for DPS? Is this one of the inspection requirements? I have no, if not from a D, if not from a TDLR standpoint, we're not asking for that right now. Okay. Do we have to issue e-course codes or can the students uh, sign up on their own through the MSF website or whatever website they're using? We do not have regulatory standing or uh, processes in place for that. So that would be an MSF requirement that you would need to follow. Okay. Uh, do we need to enter the e-course codes when we enter in the RIMS comments? At this point, I, I would have to get back to you on that one exactly, Jeff, but I would say continue to do what you're doing, uh, what you've done in the past, uh, so as to not create any issues with, with inside of RIMS. Okay. Ford, I know you and I know the answers to these questions. I'm asking for all the people that uh, don't have access to this board and are watching the YouTube videos and are blowing me up via text right now, thumbing me up. Um, do we do the students need to bring a physical e-course completion certificate to class as a part of the record required from TDLR? Again, these are going to be um, MSF requirements and how you run your business. TDLR does not mandate how you run the actual MSF curriculum that's given by MSF themselves. It may be a good business process to do so, so that you are not um, left trying to figure out if they've actually completed their e-course before they show up or not. But again, it is going to be a business decision. TDLR, um, we, we regulate um, according to the laws and the rules that we have in place and the specificity of how you do your day-to-day -day operations oftentimes is left to the school as a business decision. And that would be one of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to be clear, a photocopy or a PDF copy, or as long as we can track their completion, then that's, we meet all the re reporting requirements for TDLR. Well, yes, we do, we do okay. not have a policy or a rule in place regarding, uh, you know, how you're, how you're verifying the validity of their uh, e-course that they're coming into you with. Okay. Uh, does gender have to be a required field for entry into RIMS? Jeff, I'm not sure on that one, but I can get you an answer afterwards. Okay. Uh, will uh, TDLR put on an annual coach conference? At this time, I do not know that we have any plans to, but I would say that we would be happy to talk with you all offline. Um, or you know, within our work groups and determine, you know, what, what those look like in the past and the value that we get out of it and moving forward, um, you know, what we would look, what that would look like. Okay. Uh, is there plans in the works for a standardized set of uh, forms such as a waiver or a minor consent form since those are required and there's required verbiage uh, in them from TDLR? We are not currently working on such forms. Um, again, I would go back to uh, we can set that up in a work group um, and look at the need and the uh, and the process behind how we would implement such forms. Thank you. How do you report a location change or to remove an old location from uh, the TDLR tracker that's available to the public and to find my school? So if you have a location change of your actual range or your school, there's a form that's submitted. And then when that information is updated within RIMS and with our database, uh, when it's updated in our database, it should automatically reflect on the website. I believe that's what you're referring to on the, the tracker. Right, yeah, I've got locations that I haven't been at in 10 years, but when the stuff moved over from DPS to TDLR, it just populated like I'm still in, at an old location. Absolutely, yes, sir. And we, so when that file came over, 
um, any location or range that may have been there at auto populated into there. But uh, if you'll get with us, we'll be happy sure. to correct for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what needs to be in the records and what are the inspections looking for so that we can prepare for more of these inspections coming down for the rest of us? So one of the things that we're, we usually do is when we perform an audit, we'll put out a checklist of things that are out there. We've actually just finalized our checklist. Um, it's a very long list of basically everything that's within the rule. And that's the easiest thing to tell you is that everything that is within the rules or the law that you're required to do or perform is something that we will look at. Um, it's a very long list here, but um, you know, obviously making sure the range, runoff, uh, your classroom records that you're teaching the curriculum to specification, uh, instructors are being licensed, you know, that you have the materials in place to actually teach the curriculum that you're um, responsible for teaching are all things that we're going to check. But uh, Ford, they, could you say, uh, Mary Winston TDLR, when you say we're going to put out the checklist, mm -hmm. you mean put it out on? <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Mary. Uh, typically, we put a uh, what to expect during inspections or audits type uh, list on the website. Um, and we'll be doing that here shortly for motorcycle as well uh, when we start moving forward. But I can also get you a list after this as well if you wanna see the, the full checklist. Or... Right, I just needed to know what forms I had to have collected or can we go to an electronics uh, type forms um, like course waivers, minor consent forms, such of that nature. So can we go electronically or does it have to be pen and paper that we have to keep in a record and file away in a shoe box and store out in the barn up in the attic? With, uh, we, you know, for all of our programs and especially within the rules of this, we're not dictating that it is necessarily paper uh, records. Uh, many of our programs have both electronic or paper records. Um, so we're willing to work within both so long as those records are accessible for anybody coming through to do an audit um, of that school. Perfect. Uh, the new TEKS uh, incident report from, from uh, TDLR, uh, who is intended to do the report? Is this supposed to be a side of the road kind of thing with a coach doing it next to the student? Or is this something that one of the uh, people who enter information in into RIMS is supposed to do it after the fact? Uh, you said the TEKS TDLR incident report is, I mean, TDLR has our incident report, but I'm not aware of a TEKS specific one. No, it's the one that's published to the website. Sorry. Oh, on our website. Um, so it would be done in the same manner of how you're doing your incident reports currently for your curriculum. Uh, whoever's responsible for that, the instructor um, at the end of the day can submit those. Okay, then one minor request that we have to submit with it. Can you add in some of that blank space on that form the range diagram so that we can submit it on one piece of paper? Uh, as you know, it, it uh, we teach rain or shine. So filling out an eight and a half by 11 on the side of the road uh, is not always the easiest thing to do. If we can miniaturize that in some form or fashion, or at least get it all onto one page, uh, because this is an additional thing we have to stock at the range and it even calls for a range diagram to be drawn. And uh, speaking as a motorcyclist, I'm not much of an artist. Um, so even just something with the four corners, a little thing that says stationary on it, and that's good enough, and we can fill in the blanks. Uh, that's what we're dealing with right now. So this way it wouldn't be such a drastic change because right now I'm dealing with a little little piece of paper that I keep all my records on because it's a ton of information. Plus, for business purposes and for legality reasons, we keep uh, you know, witness signatures, uh, witness names, information, who else was on the range, and none of that is included on the new form. So we may want to make that part of a work group to uh, refine that form uh, just a little bit to make it uh, a little more user friendly, if you will. Perfect. Uh, I agree with you 100%. And my team that uh, does the updates on the forms is actually listening right now. So I'm sure they're diligently writing all of that down. And uh, we'll get with you all shortly to make sure. Um, I actually know that that is a form that we're currently working on updating at this moment. So we'll be happy to meet with you all about it. Right. RIMS has a feature that it can auto fill that kind of form out for us. So once it's populated, it'll just go to that form instead of the, you know, the regular one that it's doing using right now, which is if you've ever seen the MSF one, I think it's four or five pages long. Uh, yes, yes. It includes a lot of less than pertinent information, but thank you for that. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, we'll follow up with you on that one. Um, what is TDLR's retest policy on skills and knowledge test? 
we discussed this a while back. Um, so we would leave that the retesting policy up to the schools. Um, and I believe I may be misspeaking here. I know that we discussed that within the work group and I do not know if we put out a specified rule. Um, I don't know if David or Derek can jump in and save me on that one. Uh, but I believe we were going to clarify for schools that it was their uh, requirement to just put into their contract with the student um, what their retake policy looked like. So, so long as you're advising that individual that is signing up for your class, uh, what the retake policy was, TDLR is happy with that. And, and I'll jump in. Uh, Derek Burkhalter, Assistant General Counsel, TDLR. Um, Ford is correct. Um, we, do, we do have proposed rules to address that specific issue. Um, currently, we have no uh, requirements, so it's, it's kind of a business decision um, for the school to make for themselves um, or in accordance with the approved curriculum, of course, if there's any requirement in the curriculum. Um, but we do have some rules to address that issue that I'll go over today. And I'm sure you'll be glad to hear this is my last question for today. Well, at least for you. Uh, I would like to get you as a, a on record here saying that TDLR does not regulate prices. TDLR does not regulate the price of the course that you all administer to uh, potential motorcycle riders. Uh, we regulate fees for the program, for license renewals and everything else. I see, T I see Derek just came back online, so we'll get an official GC statement. And, and I'll just agree with you, Ford. And I think um, it's important for everyone to know that we, there are no caps on tuition charged by motorcycle schools uh, to students. So the market will decide um, what, what that price should be. Okay, thank you all. Uh, I have one additional question, Keith Ravel, uh, DDLR board. Um, People have approached me asking about the various curricula options. Uh, it is the uh, rule of TDLR that any variable of the curriculum can be taught as long as it meets the guidelines of the curriculum provider. Is that right? So uh, there are three options right now with MSF. Any of the three are acceptable to TDLR, correct? as long as they're done per the uh, curriculum provider's guidelines. I, I would clarify that uh, any prior approved T, uh, course that's been approved by TDLR um, or that we inherited from DPS is allowed. Um, any kind of new course or new updates or anything would have to be approved by TDLR uh, to be used. So if MSF or Total Control had a brand new curriculum, just because it's updated or provided by a provider that has other approved curriculum does not mean that that brand new curriculum is approved automatically. Those curr that curriculum, uh, the course, whatever, would have to be submitted to TDLR, reviewed and approved, because as you know, we now have our NHTSA guidelines and standards that those courses are looked to be held to, and they have to meet those minimum standards as well as our standards that we have in place as well. Right. Thank you. I, I brought that out in uh, in answer to some of Jeff's questions regarding the e-course there. Uh, at this time, the BRC, the updated BRC, you can do what's called the 5 by 10. You can do the 3 by 5 by 10 or the 5 by 5 by 10. All are accepted and rolled over with from DPS to uh, TDLR. In the past, uh, the requirement had been that everybody in the state had to use the three by five by uh, 10. And it was my understanding, and I just need it clarified here, that uh, any of those three versions, which are acceptable by MSF and that were in the uh, basic writer course curriculum update that was done years back, are acceptable to be taught in Texas now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We have not. Anything that was prior approved uh, that came over from DPS, we have not uh, taken away authority or uh, the ability to teach. Um, you know, if there is a course during an audit that is found to no longer meet the standards uh, that the state has set through and the guidelines that meet NHTSA and our uh, standards for a curriculum, 
those curriculum could be asked to come up to these new requirements before they're allowed to be taught again. Uh, but again, we would always give uh, prior notice and proper notification to that course uh, developer uh, to update that course or to bring it within uh, standards uh, so they can could continue to be taught at that point in time. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, hey, is there, are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Strong? I have a question. Chris Litvin, TLR Advisory Board member. Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment or a request. I appreciate all your comments on the incident form and uh, I definitely uh, appreciate you uh, being willing to take input on it so we can make it more um, user friendly. As Jeff said, when you're out there in on the range on a windy day when it's raining, you got all this paper. Um, from a sponsor point of view, I've got a lot of sites and we're training a lot of students right now. And that means a lot of forms and a lot of shipping and a lot of printing. And just when I print up 500 or 1,000 forms times 10, lo 10 locations, I get an email in my inbox saying, hey, we got a new form you need to start using right now. <laughs> and I appreciate the fact that we're in we're in a time of change and you guys are just putting out these forms and you're updating them and that, that changes may happen. But any guidance that you could give us as administrators of programs on uh you know a heads up hey this this forms out but we're planning on changing it soon so don't go uh hog wild on the printing for a little while and we'll keep you posted would be much appreciated i just it's not a major expense but i just hate to you know throw away you know six or ten inch stack of forms when things come out to change um also uh, i appreciate your comments on i'm one of those people or our school is tasha at my offices that have been beating you up about expired rider coach certifications and rems we still have some of those coaches that we're waiting on. Um, it's, haven't gotten a lot of feedback from TDLR on it. That we've got a stack of class reports. Some of them have incident reports on them that we can't file. Um, and it it really bothers uh, the people that work for me because they really want to file them. <laughs> you know, we're required to file them, and it's important because you never know when when there's an incident that has uh, more issues in the future than you anticipate. And we'd really like to go get those filed to cover our own butt and yours and get everything processed correctly. So um, whatever I can do to help you help me get those things, um, those coaches um, up in realm so that they can be, uh, so that we can clear off that backload of classes would be great. Absolutely, Chris. Um, I think that we would be more than happy if you emailed us. Uh, I don't know if Mary, if you want them to email advisory boards, um, just a list of instructors that you're still waiting on. And then my uh, education, uh, is happy to work with our licensing group to make sure that uh, those individuals are pushed through. Uh, we get them taken care of. And then if there's anything we need to do from the REM side, uh, we certainly will help you all uh, as a school uh, get to that, get that resolved as well. Mr. Litvin and Ford, that would be um, best. So we can just have one stream of communication. Yes. So what exactly, where do you want me to send that request? Cause I've sent it a few places. So where's the best place for me to send that? Advisory.boards at tdlr.texas.gov, and then we can disseminate within the agency where it goes. And so you'll know the one place you sent it, and we'll go from there. Uh, for the record, Mr. Litvin, you arrived uh, into the meeting at 10.06. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then uh, just to address uh, your other uh, point about the forms, uh, I agree with you 100% that we need to make sure that we're transparent if we're updating those forms, uh, make sure that the notification's going out. Uh, I know our intent with uh, making sure that these forms are electronic and that they're fillable is and that you can just submit from a click of a button is that, you know, if you did have a phone out there or you had a tablet or anything else, you're not necessarily having to print off uh, 500 of these forms. In fact, we're actually asking that they get uh, completed electronically versus handwritten because of the fact that um, a lot of times we can't read them when they come over. So we're having to send it back and forth 10, 15 times. Um, you know, and, and we're, there's some roles that will come up later that we're going to discuss as well that, that may even change this further moving forward. Um, you know, hopefully reduce the number of forms that are coming to TDLR as well. Um, but again, we're having those discussions with the work group and we're, we're always looking to how we can improve all of these processes, uh, make y'all's lives easier, um, and, but make sure that we're still getting our pertinent information. Uh, but definitely going electronic, making sure y'all can submit. Um, from right then and there uh, so that, you know, you can keep the school information and the range location the same. You're changing the instant and the the person's uh, information on it, hitting submit and hopefully able to get those out much quicker. Uh, that's our intent with our, our form updates as well. 
Okay. Um, just one comment on that. I think that's a great idea. I love it. Um, and I probably still have a few coaches who are not uh, willing or able to do that. So even though hopefully we can migrate the lion's share of the forms to digital sooner than later, it, uh, I would uh, request that there still be a, a legacy option for some very uh, senior, experienced, and awesome rider coaches that are out there doing a really good job and have been for years that are probably not going to be comfortable or capable of, of doing that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, Keith Ravel, TDLR board. I'd like to add one thing also for those of us that are in the training uh, community. Remember that uh, if you're insured by MSF insurance or through uh, USIS or any of those other things, they also have forms. So you can fill out the TDLR form this way, but uh, your insurance provider may require you to fill out the form that they want filled out as well. So one form will not fit all. Sir. Presiding Officer Ravel, a couple of comments. Yes, sir. So I just uh, feel it necessary. I want to tell you, this is some great stuff. The rapid fire from Mr. Alford, the Mr. Litfin, Mr. Ravel, y'all came prepared. This is why we have advisory boards. I will tell you, I feel like Ford needs like a, a trophy or a prize, maybe a brand new car, because that was a lot to take in. But I appreciate it. We appreciate it. That's going to make us better. Uh, some of these things we're probably going to be have to be able to memorialize either on our website. We've got FAQs. There's different ways we try to get information out. But this is uh, just really appreciate y'all demonstrating the reason for advisory boards. Mr. Alford, I'm not sure you're going to cut down all the uh, blowing up of your phone by being your industry uh, uh, um, mouthpiece. They're probably going to try to get your uh, you taking all their questions. So uh, just make sure you spread the love. If if you can direct them to our uh, E and E staff or customer service staff for the appropriate ones, uh, we might be able to to get those taken care of. So you don't have to do them all at once. But uh, really appreciate this stuff. Thank y'all. Thank you, David. A lot of this stuff is questions we've had or TDLR did a fantastic job when they took over all of this stuff and said, don't change a thing. Just keep doing what you've been doing. You're, you're kicking butt. But they didn't realize that you just authorized a thousand little things that we've been told over the years. And we, as, as people who have been highly regulated, we don't, we're not going to branch out on our own and try to do different things. So we honestly need you to tell us it's okay to do what the law says we can. It's, it seems weird, but freedom kind of feels weird when you get used to the cage. No, your point, David Gonzalez, TDL, your point is well taken. We have had new programs established at our agency and transferred programs. I would say between the two, the transferred programs are the most difficult because you have to unlearn things or God forbid TDLR has to change things to match what our model is or what our goals is uh, goals are along with the industry uh, changes and things like that. So no, your points are well taken, Mr. Alford. Uh, again, truly appreciate uh, this transparency and, and the feedback. This is what we need. Yeah, uh, Chris Litvin, TDLR Advisory Board. Just to just to just to echo and and I appreciate uh, Jeff's comments today. He's done a great job with a lot of questions. I would have had a lot of questions for you, not that many, but he hit them all. Uh, yeah, it's like I can't tell you at least once a day for the last several months. One or two or three of us have been in the office and will say, "Well, we can't do that," and one of us will say, "Really? Are you sure?" And the other two will, be, "We've never been allowed to do that. We can't do that." I mean, the the earth is round and the sky is blue and the sun rises in the east. And, we can't do that. And one of us will say, I think we can. I think we need to check. I think we need to go back and read or send an email. I mean, it's just like a, a sea change in this industry from what we, the, it, it's a, it's, it's a, you, the documentation doesn't look that different, but the, the orientation is completely different. And it's just something that we're we're struggling to get used to and adapt to. And a lot of those questions that Jeff ans asked this morning, and a lot of the questions that are answers that Ford provided, um, it, it's just good to go through them all again and try to to break some of the thought processes I've had in my mind since I started doing this in 2005, because it's been so 
consistently rigid in one direction for so long that it's really um, taking us a little while to mentally evolve to the new reality here. And and we appreciate that. But uh, just to just to kind of give you a little um, understanding of where we're coming from, it's 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 a little challenging for us to adapt sometimes because we've been doing things the same way for so long. Thank you. Understood. Understood. David Gonzalez with TDLR. We appreciate y'all getting out the life raft to go along with your sea change reference, getting out the life rafts or even the floaties uh, when necessary. So, yeah, th again, thank y'all. Okay, thank you, everybody. If there's no further uh, questions for uh, Mr. Strawn, we'll move on now to the enforcement division. And we have a Rusa Nizami prosecutor who's going to give us the update on enforcement. Good morning, board members. My name is Arusa Nizami, and I am a prosecutor with the Enforcement Division, and I will present the Enforcement Division's staff report for you today. First, I have a few personnel updates for you. We had some recent promotions at TDLR. On January 15th, 2021, Lisa Grant was promoted to Legal Assistant Supervisor in this prosecutor section of enforcement. Lisa has worked for TDLR for over 20 years, previously serving as a Legal Assistant 1, Legal Assistant 2, Legal Assistant 3, and Senior Legal Assistant. On April 1st, 2021, Rosemary Potter was promoted to senior legal assistant in the prosecution section of enforcement. Rosemary has worked for TDLR for over 13 years, previously serving as a legal assistant three. So congratulations to Lisa and Rosemary. Now I will get into the statistics of this current fiscal year and provide you with a general overview of enforcement activities. In fiscal year 2021, which started on September 1st, 2020, and is now through March, 2021, we have opened two cases and one of those cases has closed. There were no cases that resulted in disciplinary action. The average time to close a case was about 18 days and 100% of our cases were resolved within six months. There were, again, no cases that resulted in disciplinary action or final orders. The one case that closed this fiscal year was closed for being informally resolved. To further expand on that, the case was a criminal history case which required a background check that was cleared and a license was granted by the department. At the end of 2021, there is currently one case open with the department. And lastly, we have sources of cases open in fiscal year 2021. As shown on the pie chart to the left, 50% of those cases were open due to consumer complaints, and the other with 50% was from the criminal histories. So if anyone's, anyone has any questions, please let me know. All right. Seeing as how there are no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We will move up to the executive office and call on David Gonzalez, the deputy executive director. David. Oops, Mike. Had to double click at this time. Right. So good morning. Presiding Officer Ravel and advisory board members, I'm David Gonzalez, Deputy Executive Director of Licensing Services. I'm delivering our executive report. As usual, I'll be updating you on some of our external and internal responses to COVID-19 to start out with. Um, going to take the opportunity to remind everybody listening out there that it is our website where we do the most communication. The point taken from Mr. Alford uh, earlier is if you only have this one meeting to learn everything there is to know about your program or TDLR, that's not a, a huge amount of audience we're going to be reaching, but our website is available 24 seven and we do our best to try to use that as the conduit of information for everything related to programs, COVID-19 and even legislative actions that are going on right now. So uh, that's just a plug for our website uh, for anything in between. And if there's information that's not up there that uh, we need to be considering, those are the kind of things that we could include potentially as a frequently asked question or uh, p perhaps even a page dedicated uh, to a particular need that's uh, identified. So externally for COVID, uh, we're still serving as conduit of information using the website. Some pretty big news happened back in March. On March 10th, a little announcement by the governor, executive order G834 regarding mask and business capacity. So governor's executive order removed all state imposed restrictions on wearing masks and limiting business capacity. Pretty big deal. 
He also mandated that there's no state required COVID-19 operated limit, operating limits for any business and that masks are not required. I mean, specifically made those statements. We are still being cautious with the things that we're doing. We um, are back to work, return to office, uh, response to these things has been a little bit slow because we want to make sure we're keeping people safe. Um, so we don't have open offices at the EOT building. Uh, we've actually got some other occupants in the building at the time because they needed some space. So it's caused a difficulty with opening up our uh, offices in person. We are still doing all communications through customer service licensing. Again, any customers that need to get a hold of us should be going through our website, using our emails and, and that uh, avenue to try to get their work done. It's important to know that the governor's executive order didn't prevent businesses from doing whatever they thought was necessary as a private business to keep their employees and customers safe. So just keep that in mind when you're out there in the public and doing y'all's business. Y'all still have the authority to make decisions that are gonna keep your, your businesses safe. Another important external effort that we initiated to help with the challenges, we talked about turnaround time for questions. There's also been some turnaround time issues we've had with the, the mailroom and uh, with the processing licenses. In order to combat that, Brian Francis, our executive director, used his authority under emergency rule to continue the extension of emergency licenses. And so from August 1st to May of this year, we've been able to extend licenses for up to 120 days, hopefully addressing any de delays that may have been caused by our backlog uh, with some of the challenges we had related to COVID and uh, some vac uh, viruses being contracted, quarantines, and the things that have kind of held us up. Internally, I'll share with you that it, uh, it was really our financial services division, the front lines in our mail room that caused a, um, a real uh, challenge for the agency because that's the starting point for every everything, money, the applications, uh, we had staff actually contract viruses and we went through quarantine protocols. We've had to separate them, come up with rotations so that we can keep our workflow going. I'm pleased to say, after lots of work and creat creative thinking and teamwork, the mailroom is currently caught up. So I'm gonna say that again, our mailroom is currently caught up. Here's the caveat, all the work that they did to catch up has now filtered to those divisions that have to process licenses or the education examination division has to process uh, uh, curriculums and those things. So there's still some uh, work that has to be done to get everybody what they need. It's taking the money is the part that the, the governor and the legislature likes us to do first, getting that application in, but there's more work to be done. We have taken an, a hand, all hands on deck approach trying to address that. Uh, it has not been easy, but we have actually uh, done recruiting from all of our agency divisions, asking for help to get people that have experience. Maybe they worked in licensing prior or they worked in another division where they know how to do the data entry. We uh, pulled them in into what we're calling a strategic workforce allocation team initiative. And so we have a lot of people from different divisions, field operations, who are usually out in the field doing inspections, uh, enforcement staff, because customer service is doing their part with phones and trying to take on new tasks. Everybody's contributing to this effort to catch us up so that we're not having to do those extensions by emergency rule and, and keeping up with the, the license that are coming in. We still have some work to do. We've still got a little backlog uh, going on, but we are making progress. I think. Are there any questions related to COVID-19? Any other uh, items that uh, you think need to be addressed? All right. I don't see any hands. So I'm going to go on to the 87th legislative session update. The session is always an exciting time for us. We've always been very busy uh, and always been very popular uh, with the programs and transfers. And this particular session has us uh, going through sunset as well. So the session actually started out slow this year uh, because everybody was trying to work through how they're going to get their business done during the pandemic. We, uh, when we started going to the Capitol, when we had committee hearings, we actually all had to get tested with the nose swab to make sure we didn't have uh, COVID because of recent changes. Now, as long as you have your vaccination card and can show that to them with ID, we no longer have to get tested to visit the Capitol and go to those committee hearings. So things have changed for the better. And we've seen, seen some improvements on the horizon with the vaccines uptick 
and the um, the improvements that are being made in, in health uh, issues. There's been probably over 300 bills. In fact, I know over 300 bills that we've been tracking uh, bills related to the regulation of cannabis, music therapy, sports betting. There's a whole bunch of other ones out there being considered for oversight by our agency. And you never know if they're all going to make it to the finish line, but we're tracking them so that we can give input along the way uh, as a resource. If things come up, we want to make sure it fits with our model and then we can actually regu regulate it the way it's intended. They're even considering the transfer of the Texas Racing Commission, horse racing um, and dog racing. They're considering uh, that agency that's going through Sunset, they're considering transferring that program to us. Um, and that would be a huge um, sea change for our agency in, in dealing with that. We've had our House Appropriations and Senate Finance hearings where Brian Francis presented our exceptional items for budget consideration, and they were considered favorably. Uh, the most significant exceptional item that's related to MOT and that could help with some of this stuff we're dealing with in RIMS and, and other challenges with licensing and, and the digital uh, aspects that we're trying to improve upon is that we requested funding for a new Texas licensing system that will allow for all the eight disparate databases that we have to be combined together into one. Now, we're not going to be able to take care of every program all at once. we got 40 of them, but little by little, program by program, they would be integrated in. Uh, the starting point was going to be with massage therapy, electricians, uh, some of these programs that have some more continuity and things we've got a little bit more experience with. So eventually we would get to uh, MOT and the RIMS, but that funding being approved uh, for the Texas licensing system is huge for us. Uh, again, it's not a um, uh, solution for everything because it is going to be a framework that we're provided and our staff have to get trained up, learn how to do the program themselves because we went to a third party contractor to get a lot of this work done. Now we're going to have to take the reins ourselves and implement it program by program and all the options that uh, are being made available by this new licensing system. The most significant bill that we are looking at during this legislative session, at least in, in our estimation, is House Bill 1560, which is on the House floor probably right now, or if it's, if it's not already done. It was back in September of 2019 when the Sunset staff actually began their scheduled review of our agency. They completed their report, submitted it to the Sunset Advisory Commission, who accepted public comments and held hearings. In January of this year, the Sunset Commission adopted those recommendations and it went through Ledge Council and got drafted to be become a bill, HB 1560, looked a little bit different than what was put forward by the Sunset staff. So some things had to be worked out. Sometimes uh, the translation doesn't come across uh, all the time when you're putting things in writing. And so the Sunset staff was a little bit concerned that not everything that they put in their report was being um, conveyed accurately in the bill drafting. So that had to be worked out and we were resources uh, when they needed to, to talk about some of the stuff that was being discussed. As we speak, the bills on the House floor, it could actually be getting amendments as we speak. Uh, someone could propose an amendment last minute uh, to tack on, to change something. And so that's why we're trying to monitor it. And most of our, uh, again, executive staff is over at the Capitol trying to be available for resources uh, on that information. We'll have an update for you if you want to track our uh, progress with the sunset bill. Our website has an actual legislative uh, update section. That's the place to be looking at to make sure that our agency gets continued, which is one of the recommendations and anything else related to the programs that uh, are uh, regulated by our, our agency or could be in the future. The last thing I have, to, if, if there aren't any questions on session update or, or are there any questions on the session update? So lastly, I have the numbers. Ms. Dahlia, if you wouldn't mind putting those up for me. Our communication outreach statistics. All right, so over the past six months from October to April, the motorcycle and ATV op operator website had 18,764 views. That's a pretty pretty high number, 103 per day. 65% of those visitors accessed our site from a desktop computer, while 32% did so from a smartphone. I am seeing an uptick with all of our programs in uses of the phone. So that mobile aspect is very important uh, to be able to get to our website 
Uh, lo lots of thumb action there. The top reasons for visiting the site is find a motorcycle or ATV safety school, forms and publications, applying for a new motorcycle safety instructor license, finding a licensed instructor, and ordering course completion certificates. Again, with the questions that y'all raise in these advisory board member um, interactions or the work groups, we get a sense and through this tracking, tracking of documentation, the tracking that we do with our customer service inquiries and how long it takes to process phone calls and what questions we get, all those things help us to change our website, to make it better. Hopefully put the things on there that people are going to use. And again, if y'all have ideas on things we can improve, this is a good forum for us to hear it. That's all I have to share in the executive report today. Are there any questions for me related to any of the, the stuff I presented? All right. Thank y'all very much for this opportunity. Thank you, David. All right. As there are no questions, we're going to move on to agenda item F. And that is the update and discussion on the current contract with Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service to administer the instructor training program pursuant to Texas Transportation Code 662.005 and 662.0064. Assistant uh, General Counsel Derek Burkhalter has that report. Derek? Thank you. Good morning, board members. I'm Derek Burkhalter, Assistant General Counsel for TDLR. Um, so I am happy to be able to report to you today that we do have an agreement with Teeks um, regarding the instructor preparation course. Um, the contract is included in your meeting materials. I believe it starts on page 16. The contract was signed and became effective on March 2nd, 2021. It ends on August 31st, 2021, and may be renewed for additional one-year terms. The contract essentially provides two pathways for instructor training courses administered by TEKS. First, courses conducted by TEKS, and secondly, courses conducted by motorcycle schools under provider agreements with TEKS. Now, for both of these pathways, any TDLR-approved course curriculum may be offered. I believe currently uh, TEKS is offering the MSF course. Now, regarding the first pathway, the contract provides that each quarter of the fiscal year, TEKS will conduct at least one instructor training course at, it, at the Rellis campus in Bryan. TEKS can also conduct additional courses at other locations when there are adequate resources and market demand. Regarding the second pathway, TEKS can also enter into provider agreements with licensed motorcycle schools to provide instructor training courses at the school's training sites. TEKS will manage and monitor the courses provided through these agreements and may charge reasonable administrative fees. The contract includes a set of guidelines setting out the procedures and basic content, including fees for these provider agreements. And these guidelines must be provided to all applicants seeking a provider agreement. Finally, the contract provides that TEKS will provide quarterly reports to TDLR <clears throat> concerning courses conducted by Cheeks or through provider agreements. That's a general outline of the, the content of the agreement. Um, before I take questions, I would like to give uh, Kyle McNew with Cheeks an opportunity to add anything that I may have missed. Eric, I think I think you covered it. Uh, it was it took a lot of work on behalf of our staff as well as TDLR uh, and in working with the work group. So uh, everybody that had a hand in it, I know we uh, we worked diligently to try to, to, to hit everything that needed to be hit to address all the, the uniqueness that is Texas and the way we present this. Uh, I know that we have currently we have three classes already scheduled. Uh, the May and June class is already full. The October class is already got uh, about uh, a quarter of the way full now. So we're looking forward to uh, getting things rolling in that direction. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Um, with that, can I answer any questions from board members? Uh, this is Mike Manser from TTI. Uh, actually, the question is for Kyle. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, with these new classes that are going to be conducted, potentially how many new instructors might that represent when you're done? Currently, at this time, Mike, if everybody successfully completes based on what I've got, you're you're potentially looking if if the third class fills, which we feel sure it will. Uh, that's 36 additional instructors by the end of October. Okay, thank you. 
Jeff Alford, TDLR Advisory Board. Uh, is there an option for a wait list uh, to be created for the TEKS website for students who don't pass for whatever reason and make it all the way to the final steps uh, to show up on campus? Jeff, we are working a, a wait list as, as it is now. Obviously, you know, there's a, an e course associated with it. Uh, John Young is working with people to basically fill a pipeline should we have a last minute cancellation because we don't want to lose that valuable spot uh, there in the school. Uh, keep in mind that we we do have some front end work that we have to, to undertake uh, and that's part of trying to fill that pipeline so that we can get somebody in the next class or or have some people have some people waiting to to get in should we have a last minute cancellation so yes there is a wait list that we're working with thank you chris yes sir chris Litvin, texas advisory board member uh and probably a question for kyle kyle I, i'm on your website and i'm seeing it and it's not um the sign up information you have to call the phone number so i think you've already answered the question but you have two classes out there and they're, are they both full the uh the may and june class is full uh chris when i looked just a minute ago the october class is listed uh i haven't looked for a couple days okay october october just got listed this week chris and i know that there i believe there's four already uh enrolled in that one uh, because i looked at internal numbers this morning and saw what the enrollment numbers look like Great, and, and I would just uh, I kind of echo the waitlist thing. That'll that'll be a great way for you guys to determine demand also. Absolutely, and and, and I looked at that this morning also to see what we did have waitlist numbers. Uh, and like I said, John is is working on uh, stocking that pipeline should we have some last minute cancellations. Thank you. Okay, Keith Ravel, TDLR board. Kyle, uh, how is Teeks putting the word out about these instructor updates? Yeah, Keith, uh, we have uh, relied probably pretty heavily on the TDLR website, making that connection. Ford and them got that posted out, uh, and it's uh, we're get we're getting calls here also. It's also it's also on our website and our motorcycle operations program. Uh, but for the most part, the, the word of mouth has been filling classes at this point. So there, other than than TDLR putting out something, there has not been a big uh, marketing campaign due to the fact that. We're overwhelmed at this point. Trying with, with classes being full, uh, I would I would say that uh, our game plan is is in the future as we get towards that October class, get May and June uh, rocked out, then we will uh, probably start to put some word out. Uh, other than the fact it has gone out on some of our social media. Okay, I do know that uh, when the MSF put out the uh, the email from their uh, thing that that suddenly I was told that the uh, enrollment went way up and is there a way to do that or to mike to be able to get it on uh look learn live dot org yeah this is mike from mike manser from tti uh yes we can we'd be happy to put it on our look learn live dot org website uh we also have uh, a few social media channels uh that we can send that out on as well we'd be happy to do that excellent Keith, uh, I'll, I'll reach out to Mike and get him an email with the dates on them, uh, and I'm and I will also uh, get with my staff and and see what we can do. Go ahead and try to secure some dates uh, post October, uh, just so we kind of have uh, the ability to market out that far in advance. Very good. Okay, are there any more questions regarding teeks? Yes, Chris. Uh, Chris Litvin, Texas Motorcycle Safety Advisory Board member. I'm not sure now is the right time to ask this question or if we're about to cover it, but the other pathway to becoming a Texas uh, certified motorcycle safety coach would be for out-of-state transfers. Uh, are we going to have status on a on a pathway for that? Yeah, Chris, uh, Derek Burkhalter, um, we, we will be covering that in the proposed rules whenever we get to agenda item I. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you, Derek, on that. And uh, now we're gonna ask you to change hats. We're gonna have the update and discussion on the current contract with Texas A&M Technical Institute, TTI, to uh, research motorcycle safety and provide advocacy and education to the public on motorcycle safety issues. Pursuant to uh, Texas Transportation 
code 662.005 and 662.013. And once again, uh, Assistant General Counsel Derek Burkhalter will give that report. Thank you again. Um, like you said, I'm Derek Burkhalter. Um, so this is, first I need to make a correction. The agenda incorrectly refers to TTI as uh, the Te Texas A&M Technical Institute when the correct name is actually Texas A&M Transportation Institute. And so um, I, I take responsibility for that mistake and we apologize to our friends at TTI. We'll get that right going forward. Um, the contract between TDLR and TTI is also included in your meeting materials uh, beginning on page 35. The contract was signed and became effective on March 22nd, 2021 and will continue for 12 months from that date. Under this agreement, TTI will develop and implement an education and outreach campaign to attract and recruit new motorcycle instructors and to retain existing instructors. This objective will be achieved by first conducting a research study to identify the underlying reasons why motorcyclists become and remain instructors. And then using the results from that study, TTI will develop and implement an education and outreach campaign. Um, that's kind of an overall summary of the project. Um, I'd like to give Dr. Michael Manser a, a chance to chime in to add anything I'm, I might have missed. Yeah, thank you, Derek. I'm Michael Manser from TTI. So the we all know that there's a critical shortage of instructors in Texas, and I'm really happy to see that the classes that uh, TTI is offering are starting to fill up and have already filled up. Uh, but we, we still have to get many, many more instructors. So the goal of this project ultimately is to find out how we can get more instructors into the pipeline. And uh, from our perspective, there's uh, two activities that really need to be done. First is we really need to figure out from the general riding community who wants to become instructors, why they become instructors, and then for those people who are instructors, uh, why they stay instructors and why they drop out. So both of those elements, the rider element and the instructor element, really need to be better understood so that whatever campaign we develop can be focused on those factors that we've identified in that, that research stage that, stage that Derek mentioned. So uh, we're really excited. Uh, we've already started on uh, portions of the uh, first part of that activity. Uh, and uh, we look forward to giving you all some updates in the very near future on that. Okay. Keith Ravel, TDLR board. Question uh, for uh, Dr. Manser. Uh, has, is this being done internally or has there been research on this already done by uh, the curriculum providers, MSF, total control, et cetera? Yeah, good question, Keith. It's Michael Masser again. Uh, the, we're looking into that right now to find out if MSF, Total Control, others have uh, looked into this issue. We do know of some research that was uh, conducted uh, by a gentleman as part of this uh, PhD activities uh, where he did look at uh, this, the issue of trying to get riders to become instructors and what are some of the factors why they remain that way uh, and we're actually uh, trying to get a hold of that individual that, that researcher to do some follow-up questions with him and also to give him uh, an opportunity to sort of partner with us uh, not financially but to come in and and kind of review our uh, research plan and let us know if there's any holes that he sees or things that we can augment Really, what we're trying to do is make this research as valuable to Texas as we can. And if we can get feedback uh, from, from him in that regard, we're going to take advantage of it. So, uh, Are we able to use any of the grant money that was set aside uh, when uh, this whole thing began for this? Or has that not been set up in a process yet to be able to access that? Uh, for the for the purposes of bringing this is Michael Manser again, Keith, are you asking if it, uh, that grant money could be used to bring this other researcher on board? Yes. Uh, so I think you know uh, uh, I hadn't really thought put some thought into that. Typically, uh, researchers in the academic space 
they love to talk about their research and they love to review things. So uh, I'm kind of short winded when it comes to uh, researchers, right? Uh, so I don't think that we're going to have to uh, uh, kind of deal with that particular issue. I think that uh, they'll be more than happy to help out and uh, I'm not too worried about that. So. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions for Dr. Manser? All right, if not, uh, we have been at this now for an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, I would propose that we take a 10 minute break and then resume our meeting 10 minutes from now. It is currently 1121, so at 1131, we uh, resume the meeting.
Looking through, it is 11.31, and our 10-minute break is over. Uh, again, uh, we would ask that if you are present, uh, you turn your audio uh, off, unless you are going to speak, and at least have your video on so that we may know that you are present. Okay, very good. Do we have our quorum back, Delia? I'm unable to hear. Yes, sir, we do. Very good. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, agenda item H. And these are our work group reports, the uh, updates, discussion, and possible recommendations. Um, our licensing and renewal work group spokesman, uh, Ricky Wyatt, was not able to be with us this day. Do we have somebody in that work group that could present a uh, reporter update for that? Okay, if not, we'll table that. This is Derek Parkle. We'll... I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Derek. I can provide a, a, a report on that work group. Um, if no, one, if you, no one else is able to, just one second, let me pull up a document I have. Sorry, bear with me just one moment. Well, maybe we can go ahead and move on to the next and we'll cover that one when we, when we come back. Very good. Then we will do that. Uh, we'll move ahead to the operations and logistics work group and uh, Dr. Michael Manser is going to be giving that report. Yep, thank you, Keith. Uh, Michael Manser from uh, TPI. Uh, the operations and logistics work group met uh, by video conference on February 2nd of this year, uh, basically to discuss the first draft of recommended changes uh, to the rules based on ideas presented in the last uh, advisory board meeting. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, the comments in the advisory board meeting and the comments from the public when made, they do make it to the individual uh, work groups. So our work group has received several of those and we've uh, actively addressed them. Uh, the work group continued the discussions on these uh, rules uh, by email and, and considered uh, revised versions of the uh, draft or rule itself. Uh, our work group's final recommendations are included in the proposed rule language uh, that will be presented to the full advisory board today. I believe Derek will probably take care of that in a little bit. Uh, but the included changes uh, relate specifically to uh, one, written parental consent required for students of minority age, uh, number two, personnel allowed on the range, and then finally, number three, requirements and allowed activities for range assistance. Uh, and that was the extent of our uh, activities uh, during this previous period. Keith? Thank you, Mike. Board members, are there any questions for uh, Dr. Manzer? Okay, not at this time. We'll move on to the education and examination work group, and uh, Roger Bowles will give that update. And again, not able to hear, Roger. Okay, well, better? there Hang you on. are. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, the education and examination work group met by video conference on February 3rd to discuss the first draft of recommended changes to the rules based on ideas presented at the last advisory board meeting. The work group continued the discussion by email to consider revised versions of the draft. The work group's final recommendations are included in the proposed rule language that will be presented to the full advisory board today, including changes related to uh, requirements for instructor preparation courses, uh, paved runoff areas for ranges, virtual classroom instruction, uh, documentation required for student admission, student to instructor ratios for the range, 
And finally, course curriculum standards. And that concludes the re report for this work group. Okay, are there questions for Roger? If not, uh, we'll circle back around uh, to um, Assistant General Counsel uh, Derek Burkhalter. And uh, Derek, do you have an update for us on uh, licensing and renewal at this time? I'm actually going to defer to Michael Strawn and let him deliver that report, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, Michael, Michael Strawn, TDLR. The licensing and renewal work group met by video conference on January 29th to discuss the first draft of recommended changes to the rules based on ideas presented at our last advisory board. The work group continued the discussion by email to consider revised versions of the draft. The work group's final recommendations are included in the proposed rule language that will be presented to the full advisory board today, including changes related to background checks for licensed applicants, eligibility requirements concerning DWI-related convictions, eligibility requirements for instructor preparation courses, alternative qualifications for instructor licensed applicants from out of state, and requirements for instructors to wear protective gear whenever riding to, from, and during training activities. This concludes the report for this work group. Thank you, Michael. Are there any questions? All right. We will move on now to agenda item I. Uh, this is the discussion and possible recommendation on the proposed amendments to the existing rules at 16 Texas Administration Code Chapter 98, 98.10, 98.20, 98.21, 98.22, 98.26, 98.70, 98.100, 98.104, and proposed new rule at 98.116 regarding the motorcycle and ATV operator safety program. The uh, proposed rules address new requirements for motorcycle schools, instructors, and courses to implement recommendations by advisory board work groups and department staff. And once again, we have uh, Assistant General Counsel Derek Burkhalter. Thank you, Mr. Rovell, and uh, thank you for that mouthful of the agenda caption there. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you can see, we do have a, a significant list of proposed rule changes that we're bringing to you today that all most of all of them came from work group suggestions. Um, some of them came from staff suggestions just to help things run more smoothly or based on uh, questions we've gotten that we want to clarify. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through each change rule by rule and I'll pause at the end of each uh, rule section to give all of you a chance to ask questions and, and have discussion. And then once we've covered all of the rule changes at the end, um, I'll be asking for a motion to recommend publication of these proposed changes uh, in the Texas Register so the public can view them and that will trigger the 30 day public comment period. Um, so if we go along and there are suggestions for changes um, to improve th these proposals, um, we can we can add those in. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a working uh, process and we, we have a little bit of flexibility to, to change things if we need to. So I will begin and uh, try to share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see Chapter 98, Motorcycle Operator Training and Safety? It's a blank screen right now, Derek. It's uh, dark. We may be okay. just waiting. Derek, are you going to try one more time? Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, is the text big enough for everyone to be able to see or do I need to zoom in some more? That is a trick question for anybody <laughs> over a certain age. 
I'll zoom in just a tiny bit more. Okay. Okay, so the first change we have is to section 98.10, the definitions section. And uh, scrolling down a little bit. And you'll see um, underlying text means that we're adding new language. And then when you see text with a strike mark through it, that means that we're, pro we're proposing to delete that text. Uh, so you see here the first change is to the definition of an entry level course. Um, first, we are adding uh, the phrase or endorsement to, to make it more correct that it's not just the class M license, it's also the endorsement that goes on your license. And then we're adding a phrase um, to clarify that intermediate courses, I know that that's a phrase that was used under DPS, these are courses that are designed to let you get the class M driver's license, um, but they're for people who are already kind of familiar with riding a motorcycle, so it's, it's less of a basic course. Um, but for purposes of our rules, we are including intermediate courses. Um, we're consider, considering them entry-level courses because they allow you to get that class M uh, license or endorsement. So this is just kind of a clarifying uh, amendment that we're proposing to make. Uh, and then we've added a, a new definition for instructor preparation course. Um, we're doing that because later on we're, we're providing curriculum standards for these courses. So we wanted to lay out a definition of what they are. And these are just courses designed to prepare an individual to provide instruction in motorcycle operation. And we've uh, altered the numbering accordingly. And finally, we are adding a, uh, we're defining the acronym TEKS so that we don't have to, to say that whole phrase each time we refer to TEKS. Everybody will know what we're referring to. So I'll stop there with those definitions. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll move along. Uh, the next is 98.20, the instructor license required. So first we've we put the current rule text into a, what we're making a new subsection A. And we've received a lot of questions as to whether an instructor license is required for someone who's teaching an instructor preparation course. And so we've added this phrase here to clarify that they do need to be a license. Um, they have to do instruction through an approved curriculum and they must do it as an employee or under contract with a motorcycle school. And then we've added here or TEKS to, to um, provide that if you're teaching through TEKS, um, you know, it's, it, it also fits this requirement. And then finally, we've added a new subsection B. Um, this just specifies that if you're a student who's in training to become an instructor, um, part of that training requires you to act as an instructor. And we're just specifying here that when you take those actions, you're not violating the law requiring you to hold the license to act as an instructor. So I'll, I'll stop here. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. The next changes are to section 98.21, instructor license eligibility. We've again put the current rule language into a new subsection A to allow us to add additional subsections. And so we're requiring applicants for the instructor license. Um, this is already a requirement that they undergo and successfully pass a criminal history background check. Um, we have statutory authority to do that. We have been doing that. We're just formalizing it into rule to make it clear to everyone that this is a requirement. Finally, we're adding new subsection A10. And uh, this was a recommendation of the licensing work group. Um, they wanted to clarify or to make clear that any of these offenses involving driving while intoxicated that have occurred during the preceding seven years will disqualify one from obtaining a license. Um, you'll see later in another section, we've added, added a provision to protect current licensees from being excluded for one of these offenses that has already happened. In other words, we don't want 
adding this new rule to cause currently licensed instructors to be disqualified based on things that have already happened. Um, so this is a list, um, 49.04, driving while intoxicated, driving while intoxicated with a child passenger, intoxication assault or intoxication manslaughter. Um, the licensing work group wanted these to be taken very seriously and wanted this to be an automatic disqualifier if any of these offenses occur in the past seven years. I'll go ahead and stop there to see if there are any questions or comments um, up to that point. Okay, um, we've added added a new subsection B. Um, this was this is something that we've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of calls about. Um, we've carved out a an alternative uh, path for alternative qualifications for licensure um, for out of state applicants, and um, we've done this very carefully using the commission's authority to adopt alternative qualifications for our licensees. We've tried to um, tailor it very specifically. Um, it's a little bit wordy here, but let me try to sort of paraphrase for you. Um, essentially, we want to allow for someone who's coming from another state who is experienced, um, who's been, who's held the authority to teach, whether it be through a state license or in states that don't have licensing schemes, um, through certification to teach a course for at least a year. Now the course must be either approved by TDLR or equivalent to a course approved by TDLR. Um, and so we've added um, subsections B1 and B2 because we have two different sort of possibilities. Um, not all states license motorcycle instructors, so we've had to accommodate both of those possibilities. So B1, if you're from a state or other jurisdiction, such as a territory, possibly a country, or possibly a city, that does offer a motorcycle instructor license, you would have to submit proof. Um, you would have to submit your active motorcycle instructor license issued by that state or other jurisdiction. And you would have to submit a document on official letterhead issued by that state or other jurisdiction. And the document on the letterhead must state that the license has been active and in good standing continuously for the previous year and that the applicant has taught both the classroom and range portions of the course at least six times. And so we've also added subsection B2 to apply to people coming from states that do not license instructors. Um, that person can submit proof of that uh, a certificate of completion of the instructor training required to teach the course issued by whoever the administrator of the course is for that state. Um, for example, if you've taught the MSF course, then we would ask for a certificate of completion of the MSF instructor training that you had to take to become eligible to teach that course. And then similarly, uh, we would ask that you submit a document on official letterhead issued by the course administrator stating that your authorization to teach that course has been active and in a good standing continuously for the previous year, and that you've taught both the classroom and range portions of the course at least six times. Um, so working with the licensing work group, we, we kind of carved out these standards. Um, we think this will allow people to come and teach in Texas um, without having to take redundant, um, basically, without having to retake a course that they've essentially already taken when they've, um, they have experience and they've taught the course at least six times. I'll go ahead and stop there to see if there are any questions or comments. Jeff Alford, TDLR board. Uh, this is going to cover our military folks, is that correct? This is what we specifically drafted this for so that they would be able to be rider coaches, rider coach trainers, in jurisdictions and maybe not for the state but for the military and come to texas because they've attended the exact same training still be an authorized uh coach here in texas is that right that is correct so that would fall under other jurisdiction and yes we that that would accommodate those folks chris lipton motorcycle safety advisory board member um i, I totally understand and agree with the requirements here 
my concern is because we've had coaches from other states that only taught the range consistently and didn't teach the classroom or vice versa. And that's not what we want. We want coaches that have experience teaching the entire curriculum. But my concern is if I was a program administrator in a state or a state program administrator, and I was asked by a coach that was a, a citizen of my state, a resident of my state for a, a document on letterhead stating that he had taught six classes and both range and classroom portions, I might not know that. I might not feel comfortable certifying that because I might not have that level of granularity of detail for that coach. You know what I mean? I mean, they filed that they were a, a, a coach of record on the class, most likely. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I know why they're there, and I think we want to have that information. I just wonder if we're going to have some issues with program administrators not wanting to sign off on something like that if they're not, if they don't have that level of granularity of record. Just a thought. And and that I think you bring up a good point. Um, and it may be that we have to kind of see how this plays out and see what difficulties we confront, and then in the future we may have to modify it to some degree. Um, the difficulty for us is um, basically laying out what evidence one has to submit. So I'm sure our licensing division will um, work with that applicant and um, you know see what we can do to accommodate that if it becomes an issue. Um, you know I would think that instructor could possibly provide proof to that administrator that you know here are my six courses. I can show you I've done it. Um, you know, can you please add that to your letter or at least have the letter refer to these documents or something to that effect. Um, I know at TDLR, our staff, we try to work with everyone within the reason. Um, and again, if, if, if this becomes a huge obstacle, you know, we can change it in the future. Or if you have suggested language now, we can, we can look at making that change now. Uh, I'll leave it up to you, but I mean, the language you just spoke sounds good to me i mean maybe if you could put a, a a footnote or an asterisk that said in in absence of the following uh other additional evidence of completion of six courses both range and would be considered something to that effect like if if, if you're unable to uh, um provide the required documentation other uh evidence of completion of the requirements may be considered by tdlr in issuing a out-of-state license transfer something to that effect but it's a, it's just a, if you're telling me um, that you guys do that already, uh, that may not be an issue. But I mean, I kind of liked your language to that effect already. <clears throat> okay. Any other thoughts um, on that point? Keith Ravel, TDLR board. I'm just curious. Um, are there any other industries where somebody has to prove prior uh, work in another state before they can be licensed here if they've got an actual license? Uh, and what I'm saying is, if somebody has certification through a curriculum provider, either MSF or total control uh, in regards to this state, if their certification is active and in good standing, and they're able to pass the uh, fast fingerprinting and their CPR first aid certified, why do we need to go ahead and add additional uh, requirements on that? Well, I think we want to prevent the case where people just go out of state uh, to do their training and then have no experience and then just come straight here saying, I did my training in another state. Um, we, we wanted to prevent against a loophole um, where people just go get their training from other states just because there may be a waiting period with TEKS or something like that. And so we wanted to find have some way to ensure that they actually have some experience teaching the course and they didn't just go get their certification somewhere else. Okay, but if we are deferring to the curriculum providers for certification of you know ability to teach, does it really matter if they are trained here or trained somewhere else? Excellent point. Jeff Alford, uh, advisory board. Keith, I would say yes. If you've ever worked with a coach from Illinois or Wisconsin, where they have a vastly, vastly different view on how the curriculum is conducted than we would here in Texas. 
Um, as far as uh, coach interaction in the classroom, we don't all approach this as the same way to where we don't do, like when we did chunking, uh, a lot of those guys, they feel the classroom needs to be as long as humanly possible and the coach needs to share their experiences and stories as much as possible uh, to the point where I've been, I've had to let go of all those coaches. I've never worked with one that's going to work here in Texas because they're trying to make the classroom into an eight hour course because they need to share their personal experiences. And that's what kills me. I just can't work with them because that's how they were trained initially. Uh, Chris Litvin, advisor board member. But Jeff, you kind of make two interesting points there. One is as a sponsor or a sponsor's representative, it's kind of, I mean, you'd be crazy to take a coach that you've never taught with, whether from the state of Texas or another state, and turn them loose on your students without a, a, um, a, um, uh, teaching with them or uh, observing them once, which you did. And second of all, uh, maybe in your, but you're kind of making the argument that if they had no experience in Illinois, they might be better. All they'd gotten was the curriculum from the curriculum provider and hadn't been uh, possibly indoctrinated with strange, uh, quote unquote, not so best practice. Um, I think Keith brings up a good point. I mean, if you're going to take the uh, the certification of the curriculum provider after they've taught six classes, and you're going to take the certification of the curriculum provider after they've been trained and taught no classes in the state of Texas, I mean, it, and 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 I, I, in keeping with a lot of the philosophy that TDLR operates under, I mean, they just operate within the rules of the legislation or the rules of the curriculum provider, and it's kind of up to sponsors to implement business practices. And we have our own consequences for doing foolish things. If we uh, <laughs> hire employees that are not qualified or capable or up to our own personal standards, then we have liability for that. Um, I, I think it's a good point. And. If I may, uh, one additional thing, Jeff, you said it right there. You were able to fire them. So if that person comes in and is not doing the job well, uh, you don't have to. You don't have to use them, or, uh, or train them up and improve them. If, or if train it's them capable. up. And exactly. You know, my concern is that uh, we've all identified already at the beginning of this meeting that our number one problem that we've got right now is a critical shortage of instructors in our state. We have people dying out there right now because they're unable to get into uh, training courses. For instance, the city of Lufkin has no training course. Beaumont, Port Arthur, Orange, they have one that can do six students a week. And that's it. Uh, we need to get this ramped up quickly. And I'm just concerned that the more uh, nitpicks we put in here, the slower that process is gonna happen. If we, uh, if we go ahead and defer, as we are doing in all other regards, to um, the curriculum providers for certification, um, if they will accept it, why wouldn't we? And I'll leave it at that. Any other, uh, any other inputs on this? It, as you said, the curriculum providers have accepted it. So they've basically put their name on that coach and that comes with liability for them as well. So if a curriculum provider has given you a card that says you're certified to teach their curriculum and then they go out and have a problem, uh, you, can, you can be sure that the curriculum provider will be liable for that also for certifying them if they weren't ready to be teaching. So, I mean, the curriculum providers already put their stamp of approval on that coach. One would think they wouldn't do that terribly lightly. And then as a sponsor, I'm going to be in liability if that coach goes out and does something. So I'm not going to put my personal seal of approval on it until I've observed that coach. Um, it seems like there's a lot of natural uh, regulation here already um, that that um, has punishments along with it. Well, I would say um, we want to stay away from just having certification uh, of the provider as being the only requirement because then that's going to put people trained in Texas at a disadvantage because they can't just go take the course anywhere. Um, you know, they have to go through TEKS and so we're carving out an exception, uh, a limited exception, and we want to ensure not just that they have that certification, but that they also have experience, they're, they're experienced instructors. Um, I think that was the intent of, of having these additional requirements. Um, Again, sorry, people, you, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to. So is, it almost sounds like you're uh, making an argument for getting rid of the teach requirement. 
I'm just being sarcastic. Well, that, that, that's certainly not uh, the intent of my statement. Um, I understand. I, I think we just we want to honor the fact that the legislature decided that Texas coaches must go through cheeks. And so when we carve out an exception to that, we want to be very careful and we want to consider not just education, but also the experience of that applicant. Um, and the final, sorry. The final thing I would say is um, just remember that um, we would be publishing this and allowing the public to to comment. And so we would take any comments we received from people in the industry about any ideas for changing this or anything. And we can look at all those comments and decide to make changes later. Um, these rules will come back to you again before they go into effect. And so we'll have the the advantage of looking at all the comments from the industry and from the public, and that may allow that may give us additional information to help us with this. Derek, room. I was gonna Mary Winston. I was gonna kind of second that that this is what we call in the agency the first bite. So this is what we get this first taste, the advisory board of the work that's been done and done so far. This is put out for 30 days for the public to give us insight, ask questions. Typically, they give suggestions, which are welcome. And then Derek has the fun time of compiling all of that and bringing it back to the board for further discussion. So we've gotten a couple of really good points out today, and I, I feel like uh, the rest of the professionals um, that are teaching and administering this these courses will have possibly more insight and we'll get to Derek will compile that and we'll get to kind of discuss that in the next meeting. Chris Lifton, advisory board member. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. I just have one more thing to add and I'll keep it very quick. Possibly we could simplify this and accomplish the not getting around the TEKS training just by saying that you must be a, a resident of the state that you took training in at the time you took it or that you can't be a resident of the state of Texas. <laughs> and come in with an out of state, you know, at the time you got your certification, that would get rid of all the uh, letters and, and requirements and proof and all this stuff. If you could just prove that you're a resident of the state that you, at the time you uh, attained the certification, then you couldn't, you know, run around the requirements like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, unless there are other comments about that particular change, I'll go ahead and move on. The next changes are to 98.22, the instructor preparation course. Um, first, we've just updated a reference here um, because we added the new subsection A, we, we need to reflect that everywhere that that reference is included. We've updated the reference to TEKS. Uh, to subsection B, we've um, updated the different requirements. Um, we've added subsection 10 about the uh, DWI crimes. And then we've added a section to, to specify that to take the, to take the TEKS course, you, you must have a criminal history that meets our requirements. Um, but TEKS will not be conducting its own criminal background check at the time the applicant enrolls for the TEKS course. That will be that background check will be done at the time the individual applies for the TDLR license. And so we've added subsection C here to inform the public and the applicant that if they want to determine if their criminal history will meet the requirements before they enroll in the TEKS course, they can submit a request to TDLR to go ahead and do that background check and to issue them a letter. Um, stating whether or not they would qualify. And then that way they don't have to uh, gamble um, on that point. And so those, those are the, the changes to this particular section. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. The next change is to section 98.23, instructor license term and renewal. Again, we've updated um, cross references. We've added our new subsection A9 and A10 that were in our instructor licensing eligibility section. Um, and here is the 
essentially the grandfather clause that I was referring to earlier. I know this is worded a little bit confusing, but the intent is that um, at the time this rule goes into effect, which right now we anticipate a September 1st effective date, um, if you already have a license when the rule goes into effect, we don't want you to be disqualified when you try to renew that license based on an offense that happened prior to when you when you first got that license. So again, the intent here is to make sure that nobody who's already an instructor when this rule goes into effect about the DWI crimes is then disqualified because of this new rule. We don't want it to retroactively exclude anyone. Any questions or comments there? Just a quick question. You mentioned that you expected the effective date to be September 1st. I know that's just an estimate. Is that true of all the thing, all the changes that we're reviewing in this document? Would that be your estimated effective date? That's correct. Yeah, the, all of these changes will be presented essentially as one um, rule package, and so they will all follow the same path. They won't be, you know, unless we need to separate one out and do something differently with it because of some reason, every, it'll be one big rule package that, that all takes effect at the same time. Great. Thank you. And then my colleague just messaged me going back to the previous point about uh, requesting a criminal history evaluation letter from TDLR. Um, we are currently reducing the cost of that evaluation letter from $25 to $10. And that, that rule should go into effect uh, within the next few months. Derek? Uh, Jeff Alford, TDLR board, Advisor Board. Do you have an idea of how long the criminal history evaluation letters might take? I know it's case by case, but ballpark. I do not know that. Um, if, if any staff on the call um, has that information, um, I would invite you to jump in. You know, again, it, it's just going to, I mean, like you said, it, it's it's going to vary from case to case. I mean, you know, if your history is clear, then it's not going to take long to confirm that. But um, sometimes, especially looking at crimes that happen in other states, um, you know, it takes a while to sort of analyze whether that crime, you know, what is the analogous crime in Texas. Um, and so sometimes those sorts of um, evaluations have to occur, which which could delay it. And depending on staffing needs and, and things like that. It's just, it's really hard to say. Mary Winston, TDLR, and uh, I agree with Derek, and we will, that will be something that, you know, time will tell. Uh, if we get stats uh, from enforcement, because that's an enforcement um, question on another program, we could take a look at it, but we're not sure how it would coincide. But uh, Jeff, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, moving along to section 98.26, motorcycle school license eligibility. So here we've um, added to subsection two, that each controlling person of the school and controlling person is defined in our definition section. Um, each controlling person must, un must undergo and successfully pass a criminal history background check. And again, that's something that we already had the statutory authority to do. We're just formalizing in our rule to, to uh, be transparent. Any questions or concerns about that? Ninety-eight point seventy instructor responsibilities. Uh, in subsection three, we just have an updated reference because we added the little a. Uh, same to sub part four. Uh, subpart 14, um, this was something that came up in, I think, our licensing work group that was a little bit off topic for that group, but we decided to go ahead and add it. Um, they wanted to, make, the work group wanted to make this change um, to require instructors to not just wear protective gear when riding during training activities, but also when the instructor is riding a motorcycle to or from training activities. And I think the thinking here was that um, we want our instructors to set a good example. And if students see the instructor pulling up to the course 
without a helmet on, without a jacket on or gloves. It just sets a bad example and it sends the wrong message to students. Um, so that was kind of the thinking here, sort of the all the gear all the time mentality. And then we've just um, kind of moved the language about ensuring students wear the gear. We've made that its own subpart 15 here. And then we've renumbered this last part accordingly. Any thoughts about that? Okay. Okay, I'm just got a message from someone in our licensing staff. Uh, says we usually get the response within one to two days, depending on if there is a backlog. And I think she's referring to the criminal history evaluation letter. Okay, uh, moving on to section 98.100, training site requirements. Again, we've added new subsection A that allows us to create subsection B. Um, we did make a change to subpart F here, and this is the uh, requirements for the range in subpart A1. We've added a requirement that to be approved, the range has to be surrounded by a paved runoff area free of surface hazards and obstacles of at least 20 feet from the perimeter of the range. Um, we checked all the approved courses and it appears that this is a common element included in all of them. And so this would not have the effect of disqualifying any courses or any currently approved ranges. Um, but we felt this was important to uh, provide safety. Any uh, questions or concerns about that? Okay. And then we've added new subsection B. Um, and this is just to clarify to everyone that um, a classroom does not have to be a physical building. And um, basically, virtual classrooms are not prohibited. You can have some element of the classroom portion of the course um, done online, which is currently being done in some courses. So this isn't necessarily a new provision. We're just spelling it out in the rule so we can cut off some of those questions. Questions or thoughts there? Okay, 98.104, student admission requirements. Uh, we've made changes to subsection C um, to require that students who are younger than 18 years of age must have written consent signed by that person's parent or a legal guardian for the person to participate in the course, not just to receive medical treatment. Um, and that the signature of the parent or legal guardian must be notarized or provided in person at the training site. This was just kind of an oversight in our initial um, rules. Um, I think basically because people of minority age are not able to contract legally. Um, this is kind of a requirement that parents have to contract on their behalf. Chris? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, Chris Lippman. I think we may have lost him. Okay, um, I just, yes, sorry, my computer froze for a second, but it, it just thawed out. Um, so just to clarify, uh, this rule, Section C, says that we have to have a minor waiver form that does the things it says and that it must be notarized. Uh, but I think it was asked before, in the past, M, uh, the MSU provided a form that we were required to use and TDLR is not. They're planning to require the form but not provide the form. Is that the way we're looking at it? That's that's correct. That's uh, our current plan. Um, basically, we're just setting out the requirements that must be in there from TDLR's point of view. And, um, you know, you're free to add other things depending on what your insurance may require or depending on what your particular business practices may be. We're just saying that whatever that form says, it must include this this language or this provision. Okay, thank you. And then we've also added subsection D to provide additional requirements. Um, 
a motorcycle school must inform each individual in writing of the school's policy regarding how many attempts the school allows students to make to pass the knowledge examination and the writing skills test required for the course. Um, again, we're not telling you what that requirement is. We're just saying you set your own requirement, but you have to give notice to the applicant. We don't want it to come as a surprise to someone later on if they're not allowed to retake the, the test. We want that information to be provided to them up front before they sign the contract. Uh, Chris Litvin, advisory board member. What does it mean in writing? I mean, could this be a click-through agreement on a website before signing up for the class? Or does it right, have to be right. hard copy? In writing um, should not be interpreted to mean it has to be a physical paper with ink on it. Um, we anything that can be done, anything that can be done electronically is considered in writing. It just has to be words, written mm -hmm. words, not not orally spoken or something. Like so, that. here's the here's the catch for me. Uh, most of our customers sign up on our website. We could add a click-through agreement so that before their credit card is charged, they agree to these terms. We could add this list of the terms. Some of our customers uh, are not comfortable using a computer much, and they call us on the phone, ask us a whole bunch of questions, and we sign up for them over the phone, and we read them all the things as we click through for them and sign them up with their information and their credit card and their email, and we send them the confirmation. But for a phone sign-up that is you know, a significant minority of our registrations, they would not get. They would get that um, that the information in the confirmation email after they'd signed up for the class. So they wouldn't have any writing. They would only have verbal um, uh, uh, information for that until after they were charged, and then they would get it by email. Is this would that scenario violate this requirement? I, I could see how it could be interpreted uh, to violate the requirement. Um, I, I can't see TDLR um, having an enforcement action based on that, um, but if you have any suggestions for how to change this language to accommodate that. Um, yeah, that's the catch because um, this would basically, uh, by the letter of the law, it sounds like it would preclude uh, signing people up over the phone, which a lot of sponsors do. And I mean, we can have a, a policy document that says all of our employees read this to them on the phone, you know, when they sign up on the phone, but we we couldn't prove it, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that they didn't forget or that they didn't tell them. The student could say, well, they never told me. Well, they do it all the time, right? You never told me I had to be there at 7 a.m. You know, we told them five times and it's on the website and on the email and they always, you know, claim ignorance. So I don't really have good a suggestion for language, but I think that's a big uh, hole there is is on phone, phone over the phone signups, we can't really, um, we can we can we can show that it's on our flyers. We can show that it's on our website, which is presumably where they got our phone number from. Although they could get it from a search engine or anything else as well. Uh, I don't know that I could prove that I'd given them that to them in writing, hard copy or virtual before they signed up if they registered over the phone. Well, um, I, I guess is it possible to consider them to not be admitted to the course until they've been provided um, that email or or whatever? Um, well, they've paid for it before they've received the email. Um, I mean, what would that mean? So let's say, for example, somebody signs up over the phone. I send them an email confirmation. It has this term, these terms in it. They read it and say, oh, I wasn't aware of that. I want to, I want a refund. Uh, what would be that we'd have to, I mean, can they, if they call us back in a half an hour and say, I didn't know I need a refund, that's fine. No problem. We'll give them a refund. But if they sign up for a class in two weeks and then they call us on Friday afternoon before their Saturday morning class and say, I just read my email. I need to cancel and I don't have time to fill that seat. Uh, that wouldn't be so fine. So I don't mean to drag this discussion down into the details, but yeah, this is kind of a big hole. I don't know what the other sponsors here uh, feel about this, but we do. I mean, we, I don't know what percentage. 30, 40 percent of our students sign up over the phone. So this is a large uh, issue. Derek, Kyle McNew. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, Kyle McNew, board member. Chris, I don't know if this will work for you. If we do some sort of changing where it says we have to inform the individual uh, verbally uh, and in writing, when you do your over the phone, if you if you cover those two items, and as you mentioned in your, when you mail out that final confirmation that they've been charged and are enrolled if that that verbiage appears on that confirmation. I think we we meet the wicket. We just 
probably need to massage the, the verbiage in D that says it must be informed uh, in uh, verbally and, uh, and in some form with a follow up written document that shows, shows that information on it. I think that would fix your, your phone registration. If you're doing a phone registration that says, hey, by the way, the policy is I have to inform you. My school policy is this for, for number of attempts, et cetera. Uh, and you will receive a, a confirmation of that in your, your written receipt that you, you will receive. Would be. Is that is that a workable situation? That would be fine with me. I, I just, it, it, so far as TDR goes, I don't know if it's enforceable, but uh, Derek kind of said that he didn't imagine this would be an issue anyway. So yes, for me, if it says in writing or verbally, then that would solve my issue. And if we change it to uh, prior to admitting an individual, if it was written to as part of the admissions process, the student, the individual would receive this in writing. Obviously, receiving your receipt would be part of that admissions process, I would think. Right. But th yes, the, the question just comes in. What if they have a problem with it once they get it in writing? What what are, what are their rights at that point? Because, I mean, the whole reason that we're um, disclosing this to them is because if they're not, uh, if that's not acceptable to them, then they wouldn't go through with it. Right. So, like, if I were to give it to them in writing before they paid and they said, well, I don't agree to this term, so I'm not going to pay then everybody's good. But once they've paid and then I give it to them later, what what are their rights? Can they cancel within 24 hours or within forever until right before the class? That's that's the rub. But yes, if we just changed it to verbally or in writing, that would solve my problem. But it would kind of defeat the purpose of the requirement, I think. Not really, but it would certainly take some teeth out of it or some enforceability out of it. So I'm sorry, I I, I have an issue. I don't have a good solution. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, maybe something we could uh, discuss offline. Or maybe we just wait and see what the public comments are, and um, we can think about it a little bit more. And if we come back and look at the public comments, and maybe, you know, maybe we've thought of some better language, we can make that adjustment later on. Maybe to Kyle's point, I'm, I'd be probably happier if you if you put in writing or verbally, and then let that go to public comment and see if anybody has an issue with it. Okay, okay. Keith Rubin, TDLR Advisory Board. Are there any uh, other licensing uh, programs out there, such as Robert said, that already have something like this in place we could use as a model? I'm not I'm aware sorry. of any. Uh, go, go ahead, board. Sorry, I'm trying to get my. Oh, Michael Strong, TDLR. Uh, yes, uh, actually, DES, our driver education safety training program, does have this same type of language. Um, for them, you know, they're not doing an over-the-phone sign-up. They're doing online sign-ups where people are, you know, clicking through and doing their confirmation, or they're doing it in person at their schools, uh, so they have that uh, information, uh, you know, on their, their contract, their written contract for those people at that time, uh, and they cover kind of this stuff and additional uh, requirements for anything that they would be removed from class, uh, the requirements beforehand, conduct policies, et cetera. Uh, but this is something that we do uh, in other industries and especially DES. Okay. Okay, so I've went ahead and made the change uh, by adding verbally or verbally or in writing. Um, so we'll just note um, when we vote that we've made that change to the text, and then we'll we'll see how the public comments come in. Um, and then the, the second element um, that an individual must be informed of is that um, if the student's writing performance creates an unmanageable danger on the range, that student must be removed from the course and is not entitled to additional attempts to pass the writing skills test. And that's again just so it doesn't come as a, as a surprise to anyone if it becomes clear that they just can't manage the motorcycle. Um, you know, they, they've been made aware of this up front. I, I don't know if this um, needs to be in there, but I wouldn't mind seeing uh, some verbiage that this is at the sole discretion of the rider coach. At the sole discretion of the if the student if the student who's writing performance creates that the sole discretion of the rider coach an unmanageable danger on the range just you know i mean i guess that's given but um having dealt with a lot of students well i didn't think i was unsafe nobody else in the class thought i was unsafe 
you know, they're, they're not the trained instructor. We have one professional trained instructor. He's responsible for the safety of the course, and he's the one who makes that decision. Okay. So if we added here, comma. It doesn't have to be, I just, you know, you may have some better verbiage for it. That's just what popped into my head at first. But I I just, my suggestion is that that we, uh, while we're disclosing these things to the customers, which I think is a good idea, that they understand that, you know, you know that the writer coach is, is the one who makes these decisions. Okay. Or the instructor or however we've defined it in the definition section. I'm going to just add here comma as determined by the instructor. Comma. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then finally, we've added subsection E prior to admitting an individual to any course, a motorcycle school must inform the individual. Um, and I think this probably has to be done in writing of the department's name, mailing address, telephone number, and website address. For the purpose of directing complaints to the department. Um, I guess we do again run into the same problem that, that you brought up, Chris, for over the phone. Um, I don't I'm not offended by this because because the verbiage says uh prior to admitting an individual to any course. So if it's not paying and it's prior to admitting, when they sign up over the phone, they pay me and I, I reserve a spot for them and I send them out the email and I can put this this information in that email confirmation, which they will have in their hands before they're physically admitted to the class. Uh, th this isn't the kind of, I mean, this doesn't bother me because this isn't something that they should object to. Like, I didn't realize that I, um, I had to do these things. I'm not okay with that. This is just informing them of your information so that they have a problem. They have the right person to report it to. So as long as they're provided with that information before they attend the course, uh, that's not a problem. We can just add that to our confirmation. So I don't have an issue. Okay. Derek, Jeff Alford, advisor board. Um, is there a standardized uh, information that we should be adding to address this information where you want this to be information directed to? Like you go into a locksmith, they have that little poster up on the board. It says you want to file a complaint do it here. Is there somewhere where that's all pre-written? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, Mary Winston, TDLR. We do have that requirement with uh, several of our programs. I'm thinking all of them, but I don't want, as a lawyer, you never want to say all. Um, so that verbiage can be uh, drafted as an example. Um, Ford is still on, and I just lean on him with this program. But in other programs, we do have to file a complaint. You know, it's it's kind of standard language, and we can make that available. As a link, this is Roger Bowles, I'm sorry, as a link on our website? There are, Ford is, is, messaging me sorry um i don't know that there's a link right now but we can add that within ford if you could pop in if you're still available uh on some of our programs we do have that disclosure as a requirement and many times we provide these things as pdfs for download or what have you um ford if you caught that information the conversation about yeah just notifying where you could file a complaint i know we have standard language for that. Um, I don't know if we have an FAQ yet or where it is. So Michael Strawn, TDLR. Um, yes, most of our language that we have is um, is standardized. We, we we're happy to provide that to you all. Um, we have complaint signs in some industries. We have language that we provide uh, that's been standardized uh, for schools to use on enrollment contracts. Um, so we're happy to, uh, to provide that. Um, we try not to get directly into exactly what that looks like uh, when we tell you that, you know, just they need to be notified um, of the department's name, mailing address, contact. Um, we never try to be that prescriptive usually in our rules to say you must use our exact language uh, so long as you're meeting the requirements that are down there below of name, address, website, um, you know, and, and everything else. But we're happy to put that information out there so that y'all know where to direct them to directly. Um. 
thanks thanks michael this is chris lit an advisory board member if uh, my opinion of how i would like to see this work is i really appreciate that you not being too prescri prescri prescriptive and forcing us into a particular language on the other hand uh, you may be in some of your other programs dealing with larger corporations that really enjoy drafting legal documents and things and i think you'll find that us sponsors really don't like to do that so a happy balance might be that you do what you've done in this document and say this is what you have to do and as long you can do whatever you want as long as it meets the requirements however we have provided you with it with an example text that does meet the requirements that you may use if you wish that would really be probably good for us that way we'd have something unless we have some kind of problem with your example i think you'll find probably a 90 percent adoption rate of the example text that you give us not and i'm not the reason i'm making all these comments is not just for this but also if we could get that for the minor waiver form if you could give us just uh, example text for a minor waiver form with the Texas approved notary signature block and the requirements that are in the rules that we could steal from you instead of creating our own. I think uh, that would ensure that would, I think that would go a long ways toward helping us comply with the rules easily and not um, to the best of our abilities failing to comply to the rules because we tried and didn't quite get it right. If you could give us an example that make that we are confident meets all the rules, I think most of us would probably just adopt it. Um, and that would be appreciated. That's just a suggestion. Mr. Liff and I, I appreciate that. And uh, we do actually have a complaint sign and, and information. Uh, and Shanice is on the side messaging me right now. And we're already going to work on getting that put to the website here uh, very shortly. Um, as for the uh, notice for the minors and everything, I believe we have something somewhere in other programs that we can utilize, especially from driver education. Uh, a lot of that stuff deals with the, the minors. And we'll look and see what we can pull over. It may take us a little bit of additional time to draft that, however. And Mary Winston TLR for the flyer for the department information. Um, and I'm saying flyer because I've been messaged by someone from licensing. Thanks, Chloe. That um, there, there, it's a flyer and other industries post it. So we can get that as an example or a sample because we do have that kind of already ready. Um, but saying it's a sample and as long as it includes this information we don't care if you put flowers or hubcaps on it we it's good enough great thank you very much okay um go ahead and move along 98.106 verification of course completion uh, we've added subsection D, a course completion certificate for an entry level course may only be issued to a student who has successfully completed the knowledge examination and the writing skills test required by the approved curriculum for the course. Um, this is just kind of formalizing this in the rule. Of course, it was already a requirement that they complete the full course. We just wanted to spell that out. Um, a motorcycle school may allow a student to make multiple attempts to pass the knowledge examination or the writing skills test, but any student whose writing performance creates an unmanageable danger on the range must be removed from the course and is not entitled to additional attempts to pass the writing skills test. And so here we would probably want to again add what we added to the previous rule, which is as determined by the instructor. With that change being made, are there any concerns or questions? Let's move to 98.108, the course requirements. Uh, we've made changes to subsection C. Um, first, rather than referred to it as on cycle instruction, we've call it range instruction. Um, and then we've changed the instructor ratio to just be eight students per instructor across the board, rather than having the previous, uh, the previous where you you had six students until you've taught seven courses, and then you can move up to eight students. Um, we've just made it across the board to eight students. Um, or if the approved curriculum has a more restrictive ratio, of course, you would have to follow that curriculum's ratio. Um, we Eric, think I have a question for you on this one. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Alford, uh, advisory board member. If the number for this one is 
Um, dyslexia is killing me. Uh, eight. Oh, wait. It's taught seven courses. Uh, is, should that be the, oh, I'm sorry, that's a stricken out language. So my question really is, is should we match this number to the number we talked about earlier um, that caused all the contention? So that when, when coaches come over from other places, they come over as eight to one automatically. This way, TDL does not have to go back in and change update their certification. They just say they're eight from the very beginning because they came over with that experience. Um. You're talking about the out of state alternative qualifications. Um, right, I was trying to match these up, but I yeah, see that was part of the stricken out language. Yeah, we didn't we didn't address um, instructor ratios in those alternative requirements. It was just the number of times they had taught the course. They had to have taught the entire course at least six times, but it, it didn't speak to the the ratio of students to instructor on that. Um, so if someone had taught, you know, the course six times in another state, it's possible they could have had more or less than eight. But all we're saying is in Texas, we're limiting it to eight. So Derek, can I can I uh, clarify on that? So Absolutely. if these rules became effective, um, Mr. Alford, then anybody coming into the state uh, or being licensed newly in the state would automatically be eight to one. There, you know, the only time there would be a more restrictive ratio is that the curriculum provider itself required that that person was limited. But from a state standpoint, eight to one would be the new uh, ratio from everybody. Uh, there would not be a stepped tier program or process anymore. I love it. Okay. Any other comments? Derek, Kyle McNew. Uh, because we are going to that eight to one, I would ask you, does that modify what D's intent is? Because as I read D, it says uh, there must not be more than 12 students on a range during any phase of range instruction. If I'm eight to one and I've got two instructors there, I'm 16 okay. students at that point. No, there's uh, Keith Ravel, TDLR uh, advisory board. No, there are restrictions placed by the providers. For instance, under MSF, the number of students you can have on the range is limited by your perimeter dimensions. And that's the same with total control. So that is, uh, that it's in there. Um, so like I, I have a 90 by 220 range at one of my sites, I can only do 11 students. And if you look in the back of your guides, uh, the rider coach guides, when they list range sizes, uh, it tells you specifically which ones can qualify for eight to one under MSF. And according to total control, they will never do more than six to one ever. So as I understand what you're saying, Keith, is there will never be, even though it's eight to one, it will never be eight to one to at a full capacity because it's limited to 12 by the curriculums to say that's the maximum that can be in a class. Right. And, and again, remember that the eight to one can only be done on certain ranges that are approved to that and they cannot accommodate more than eight. They're the compact ranges. So anybody doing, anybody doing what you might suggest would be in violation of the curriculum provider. Right, Keith, to your point, uh, the, the, if you have a full size range, you are ineligible for an eight to one ratio. Correct. It is over the max square footage for that range. You would need to run two coaches to have more than six students. And that is a curriculum restriction, not a TDLR restriction. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure that the 12 didn't, didn't restrict them. Uh, in light of what we were saying in the previous section. So I'm good if you guys are, if you say that that's functional. But all the things you guys are saying are correct, but they're all, what you're talking about is details of existing curriculums from existing curriculum providers. And what section D is, is a TDLR rule. So that's, that's, the, that's the point. So what this says is that no matter what curriculum you're teaching, as long as it's TDLR Texas approved, there's no more than 12 students on a range. So this could, A, if, if you're happy with the existing curriculums, you don't need to specify this as a TDR rule because none of the curriculums 
uh, allow that anyways, and B, if the curriculums in the future change to allow more than 12 students, or we adopt a new curriculum that adopts more than 12 students, then this will restrict that curriculum to 12 students. So there's a little, you know, everything you said was correct for our existing curriculums for our existing providers. So do we want to put this in here? Do we want to put this requirement in here that no curriculum in the state of Texas will ever have more than 12 students on a range at any time? And I don't know if we want to or if we need to, but that's what's proposed. I think, Chris, you, you addressed what I was getting at. So do we feel like we need to um, make this a Texas restriction? I mean, right now there's no curriculums that are approved that would violate it anyways, so it's kind of moot. But if it, we put it in here now, I, I don't, I can't imagine a situation where it would be restrictive, but I'm just saying like if, you know, if, um, I don't know, if, if a new curriculum or a new curriculum provider comes along and has 14 or 16 students with two or three coaches, I don't know. I mean, they can't do that unless we change this rule, which we could do in the future anyways. But I mean, I just don't know that we even, if it's important that it's in there anyways. Could it could right. it be worded so that it, if, if necessary, it is 16 or just like we've done in some of the other or unless restricted by the curriculum to a lower number? I, personally, I wouldn't even put it in there because it, it, right, if, if, if Texas or TDLR has a problem with it and a new curriculum comes up that allows 27 students on the range, they just wouldn't approve that curriculum, right? I mean, right now, the only curriculums that are approved already follow this rule and they would have to change that and TDLR would have to approve it or approve that curriculum. So it's kind of redundant and, and restrictive and it doesn't actually have any impact at this point. Then do we just want to totally remove the... That would be my recommendation. Um, we may not have gotten to it yet, but I'm just curious with this discussion, is there any reference to hot seating in this? Yeah, is, that, is that not really an issue because they're not on the range at the same time? No, it's coming up in the three-wheel stuff. Okay, good. Then I'll, I'll table that till later. <laughs> so, so Michael Strong, TDLR, before we move on real quick. Um, and I apologize up here. So if we're going to strike D, should we clarify within C that the more restrictive ratio um, also for the curriculum also applies to, uh, applies to the total number of students in there, not just the ratio, but also the total number of students on the, the range, uh, given the range, range size? That would be my only. Therapy. If you're a if you're a coach or a, or a sponsor and you're implementing an approved curriculum, you're already operating under these rules. You can't have more than twelve students on the range. If you are, you're violating the curriculum. And if you're violating the curriculum, then you're violating TDLR TDLR's rules because they state that we have to follow all the curriculum rules. So, I think it's just redundant. Yeah, I get that. I, just, I agree. Go ahead. I was just trying to make sure for clarification purposes for people to understand, but uh, as you said, yes, I agree. We would still be able from an enforcement standpoint, be able to enforce that. Okay, thank you. We kind of walk a fine line between being redundant and making things clear. So sometimes it's not necessary that we add language, but we do it just to, so we don't get questions about it. But um, I think it's okay as we have it here and unless anybody else thinks differently. I'll go ahead and move on to subsection E, which we would then be changing to subpart D. Um, and basically here we've just allowed that um, for three-wheeled motorcycle courses, no more than two students may share a motorcycle. Um, of course, for two-wheeled courses, um, there's no sharing, but we acknowledge that three-wheeled motorcycles cost significantly more than two-wheeled motorcycles, and so that's why we've allowed for this sharing arrangement, or we propose to allow it. Any thoughts on that point? And we have added a new subsection G, which will actually be new subsection F. Uh, we wanted to restrict the personnel who can be on the range. So what we've tried to do here is list out the individuals who can be on the range. 
Um, so of course that's instructors who are actually providing instruction, assistance, or evaluation. Um, students who are enrolled in the course being conducted. Interpreters or other assistants, other assistants providing services to accommodate a disability or other condition required by law to be accommodated. Or, and this is uh, kind of a big part here, range assistance. And we've defined, you know, we, we can't actually regulate range assistance, but we can tell the motorcycle schools um, who is allowed to be on the range. And so to be a range assistant on the range, you have to either be enrolled in an, an instructor preparation course administered by TEKS, or you have to be at least 16 years old, employed by or contracted with the school, and trained by the school to provide non-instructional support. And then subsection H, which will become subsection G, we've specified that a range assistant may not provide any form of instruction or evaluation of students, but may provide non-instructional support limited to these tasks. Moving motorcycles, setting up, removing or operating classroom equipment and materials, setting or, or removing cones or other objects for range exercises, performing on-site motorcycle maintenance, and, and uh, conducting demonstrations of riding exercises under the supervision of an instructor if allowed by the approved curriculum. So we've tried to carve out what activities a range assistant can do. Um, it was a little bit difficult to come up with that list, so we were Really, um, you know, if anyone has any thoughts about that, we welcome the, the thoughts. I have a I have a couple of thoughts for you, Chris, motorcycle advisory board member. Could you scroll up a little bit, please, Derek? Sure. Um, section I I here. Um, I I personally, as a as a sponsor, think it's a good idea if I'm going to be sending a prospective rider coach candidate to a rider coach prep class that they range aid. Um, it used to be required, it's changed and gone up and down and around and around over the course of the program. But I think it's a really good idea for, for me and for the prospective coach. Uh, so I like everything in here, um, but for section II, and so they have to be, um, if they're not, some a lot of the reasons coaches drop out of the program prospective coaches is for um they didn't know what they were getting into they didn't know they were going to be out on a hot parking lot all day they have bad back they have bad legs or whatever who knows so i always encourage them to come out and do this take the class as a student be a range aide for a session now you know what you're getting into and a lot of them weed out right then so they may not even be signed up for the course under section 4a but under 4b they'll be at least 16 years old They'll be trained by the motorcycle school to provide non-instructional support. I'm good with all that. But I, I and, and I if I have to, I could write a contract with them. But instead of saying employed by or contracted with the motorcycle school, could we just say that are there at the direction of the motorcycle school? Or should I have to should I write up a little contract with my prospective rider coaches before I let them range aid? I could do that if I had to. I just don't normally employ them or contract with them when they're just out there to see if if you know to get hands-on experience if this is what they really want to do. I think we were trying to provide a way for the school to be responsible for the actions of this individual and to avoid a situation where they can say, well, hey, you know, we didn't have anything in writing. He was just out there. I don't know what he was doing, you know. That's we wanted... point. So maybe, maybe, maybe that, that is a good point. Maybe I do need to have a little contract for them, a one page contract that says all the things that are spelled out here and below with range aid responsibilities. So they have that in writing. Uh, so that they're clear on what they can and can't do and we i i, I like it I, I think it should stay uh, but could you scroll down to the range aid requirements now sure it, um instead of spelling out all the things that they're allowed to do could we instead say they're not allowed to coach the students verbally or they're not allowed to coach the students period and they're allowed to do um pretty much everything else under the supervision of the rider coach. They're they're not allowed to have any interaction or coaching, co coaching interaction with the student, but they're allowed to do everything else under the supervision of the rider coach. I, I don't, just a suggestion, I don't know, maybe I'm opening up too big of a hole, but there's a lot, like you said, there's a lot of things that they could do. And if we haven't explicitly spelled them out, um, you know, could, and we haven't spelled uh, them out. Chris, well, could that be under II, under the supervision of a rider coach right there? Wouldn't that solve both? 
I'm um, not following you, Roger. Under I I I I instead of employed by or contracted with the motorcycle school under the supervision of a instructor. Uh, well, I don't know if it would take the place, but maybe it should at least be an addition. I'd have to think about it. I mean, that that's a good point. Any right, any range aid that would be out there should be always under supervision of a rider coach. And then, as long as they're not coaching down there under the the duties under they're not coaching, they could do anything else under that supervision. Or maybe to 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 rein it back in a little bit, just say that rain the range aides are allowed to um uh, are allowed to do any and all activities uh to facilitate the operation of the class with the exception of coaching interacting with the students on a coaching basis uh only under the supervision of a rider coach because you know there's a million things that they could do right they could go get water they could bring the cart out they could get the fire extinguisher they could place the cones they could pick up the cones they could sweep the range i mean right. there's just a ton of things they could, it's raining they could do something else they could you know they could take a student uh they could show a student where the restrooms are that's not coaching, but it's interaction with a student. So maybe if we crafted it, you know, that they can they can do anything in facilitation of the process of the course under the supervision of a rider coach, with the exception of coaching students in motorcycle safety. The so the reason that we felt the need to list out these activities is because what do we mean when we when we say coaching? Um, I mean, a judge looking at this needs to know. In other words, is conducting a demonstration of a riding exercise coaching. Um, that was why we felt the need to list that out to tell a judge what do we mean when we say coaching. And so these are the non-instructional activities that we've determined would not fit, would not be coaching. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I, I mean, I kind of said my piece. If if you think you can wordsmith up a way to just include various and sundry things that are um, that facilitate the operation of the course that do not include coaching or teaching the curriculum under the under the supervision of a rider coach, that would be more of a catch-all for anything the coach needs that the range aid could help with that don't involve coaching and implementation of the actual curriculum. Okay. Uh, does anybody have suggestions on how to improve the language we have here? I'm sorry, let me try to omit some of the noise coming through on my end. Well, this may be another um, example of where we just need to kind of see where the public comments come in and and maybe we, in the meantime, we can think of some alternative language. Derek, this is Mike Manta from TTI. Is it under G, the second to last word limited? Is it just as simple as changing that to like uh, examples include? I think we did discuss that, but the problem is that that would allow for additional things and a judge um, may not know what those additional things might be. If we just say including, then that, that suggests there may be more things not on this list. Um, and then it kind of loses its clarity. Well, maybe we just think on this, and if anybody has any thoughts, you know, feel free to email them or submit them in public comment, or we can talk about them on our next go round. Okay. Moving on to 98.110, we've just made a small change to subsection B here. Uh, we just want to make clear that notification of the approval or denial will be sent to the applicant because the applicant possibly may not be a motorcycle school. It's a pretty simple change there. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay, moving on to 98.112. 
Um, these are the curriculum standards for entry level courses. And again, these will also include intermediate courses. Um, we've just changed some of the wording a bit. Um, we wanted to make clear that um, the department is the one who makes the determination as to whether the curriculum meets the NHTSA standards. Um, it's not a determination that NHTSA would make. Um, we would require all new courses and all current courses, to, of course, to have a knowledge examination to ensure students comprehend the concepts. Um, also include a writing skills test designed to ensure students can perform the writing skills. Um, we've added four to say it must be consistent with this chapter and the law covering this program, which would basically incorporate all these other requirements that we've um, talked about and would allow us to deny a curriculum if it violates some of the other requirements in the rules or statutes. And then we're also adding five here. It would require a course to be submitted in conjunction with an instructor preparation course that meets the requirements um, for that curriculum. And the thinking there was, if you're submitting a new course, there needs to be a path for instructors to be trained to teach that course. And so we would have both of those curriculums, both the underlying basic course and the instructor preparation course submitted together. Thoughts or questions? Okay. Hearing none, move on to 98.114, curriculum standards for non-entry level courses. Of course, this is anything that is not an entry level course, so whether it be advanced courses, uh, sidecar courses, or anything like that. Um, again, we've just made some small changes to the, to the wording here. Um, and we've added that it must be consistent with the rules in these chapter in, in this chapter and with the statutes for the program, which would allow us to reject a course that um, violated any other rule. Chris Litvin, advisory board member. I just had a question on the terminology. We, we're breaking these down into entry level and non-entry level courses. Is, is yeah. this equivalent to licensing and non-licensing courses or is that not a equivalence? That would be, yeah, based, that's what it comes down to. An entry level course is a course that qualifies you for the class M license or endorsement. A non-entry level course is a course that does not do that. So just a minor suggestion. Um, part of the reason why DPS called them like basic or entry level course and intermediate course is that they were trying to encourage as many riders that were unlicensed to take the courses they could. And they felt like it might be a little insulting for them who have been riding for 10, 20, 30, 40 years to take an entry level course. Um, and I know this isn't a PR document that we're reviewing here, uh, but uh, it might um, be more uh, inclusive to people to call them uh, licensing courses and, and non-licensing courses, just so there's no, you know, um, you know, experienced riders kind of get offended when when they have to take an entry level course. Just a thought, not a big deal, not a not a material change, just more of a PR thing for a non-PR document. And I appreciate that point. The reason we chose the terminology entry level is because that's what the legislature gave us in the statute. That's what they call it in the statute. And that was also why um, in the definition section, we're making it clear in the definition of entry level course that it, it includes an intermediate course designed for more experienced riders. Um, okay. I, think, I take your point on the surface. It, can be a little bit demeaning, but. <laughs> no, I understand. And if it's in the legislation that way, then that explains everything to me. So thank you for explaining that. Okay, sure thing. Okay, and finally, last change, we're creating a new 98.116, which provides curriculum standards for instructor preparation courses. Um, those curriculums must prepare an individual to competently teach all components of an entry level course approved by the department and must be consistent with this chapter and the transportation code. So it's just a simple standard, but we have to have some standard out there so we can improve courses. Any thoughts or concerns about that? OK, 
Okay, I'm um, hearing nothing. That concludes uh, our proposed rule changes. Um, we've made small changes to 98.104.106 and .108 as we discussed and I read marked um, as we went along. Um, so at this point, um, I would be seeking someone to make a motion to recommend that we publish these proposed rules as we've changed them today in the public register to begin the public comment period. Robert Richmond, TDLR Advisory Board. I make a motion that uh, that we do so, as stated. First I second it. Second it. Okay, it would be a to take a vote now. I'm sorry. Who's sorry? Who's second? Press listen. Press listen. Okay, we've got uh, Keith Ravel, TDLR board there. We got it, I think, handled, but uh, we had an echo going on in the background. It's fixed. All right, thank you, Derek. Thank you. But, uh, a lot of good work there, board members. Um, if there's no additional input or questions, uh, we'll move on to agenda item J, which are recommendations for agenda items for the next board meeting. Do we have we anyone have... that would care to bring up things? Mr. Ravel, we need to yes, take a, uh, I need to call roll for the, for the vote. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Delia. Keith Ravel, presenting officer. Aye. Roger Bowles. Aye. Chris Litvin. Aye. Robert Richmond. Richmond. Aye. Michael Manser. Michael Manser. Aye. Kyle McNew. Aye. And Jeffrey Alford. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. All right. Again, on to item J. Are there any recommendations for agenda items for the next board meeting at this time? Presiding Officer Reveal. First yes. agenda item for next meeting will be um, these set of rules after they come back from uh, public comment. Derek has had a chance to review them all and then bring them back. So that will be um, definitely set for the next meeting. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else? Hearing none. Then we'll move on to item K, the discussion of the date, time, and location of the next board meeting. Suggestions. Robert, uh, advisory board member, Derek, when do you believe you can get these published for public comment, for, let the 30 days elapse, and have enough time to review and restack? Because I think that this draft needs to be out to the public as soon as we can. I'll defer to you for this. Um, so we we do have some requirements as far as paperwork and and filings and, and things like that. Um, and then there is some delay from the time we actually file it until it actually gets published. I think it's at least ten days before that happens. So I would say probably um, we would get them filed um, sometime by mid May and probably be published either late May or early June. Let me. Uh, check my timeline to see if that's uh, consistent with what we've estimated there. Just one moment. Okay. So we are looking to file them by May 24th which would have them actually published in the register on June 4th, which would begin the public comment period, and that would end on July 5th. Okay. Uh, as Mary said, how much time would you need to compile all the results and be ready to speak articulately about what we're going to do so we can put this to a vote and put this item to bed? <laughs> Okay, um, it's usually kind of hard to anticipate how many comments will come in, but I can try to, you know, address them as they come in. 
Um, let's see. I think based on our estimates, we would be looking to have the next advisory board meeting around July 16th. Mr. Rubin, if you'd like, I can poll the board for a couple of dates in July. I yes, think. please. Could we do that, Delia? The 19th or the 20th? Derek, would that be okay? Um, July 19th or 20th? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be. 19th or 20th. The 16th is, July 16th is on a Friday. Correct, okay. okay. Yeah, anytime the week of July 19th is, is fine for me. Perfect. Excellent. I yeah. do. I do like the 10 a.m. time, though. That's that's a good time for me. Yes. 10 a.m. And Delia, Thursdays are the only day I don't coach. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So Delia will uh, poll all the board members, and we will see what that works, and then we will notify everyone of the next time of the uh, the meeting. Correct. Very good. All right. Are there, are there anything, is there anything else at this point? If not, uh, time is 108 p.m. And at this time, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Jeff Alford, TDL Advisory Board, motion to adjourn. Kyle, second. Kyle McNew, second. All right. Then at 108 p.m., uh, we adjourn this board meeting, and I thank everybody for being in this. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Great work.